You just don't get it, do you? Podcasts are the saviors of the world. What, what, what word are you replacing there? <laughs> I know. Women. It's women. women. Yeah, of course. Women. Of course. Uh, of course. Women. Yes. Yes. David, how did you forget the crystal clear moral of this film? If this film exists for any reason, it is to remind us that women are the savior of the world, and it is laser, laser locked on that being its message. He should have said Mar women. <laughs> and then looked at the that. camera. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, it's I, I like. I just a- gave that. <laughs> A toast. I agree. I agree, um, <laughs> Mark. I agree, Mark Hogan Camp. Most of the other quotes on this page, I just feel gross to try to turn into uh, a joke because of the real world trauma. Podcasts won't be invented until 1954. <sighs> Fuck, that's a good right? one. That's Emily, good yeah, one. no, that's a really good one. I mean, the, t- <laughs> the tagline for this movie is you can't put this hero in a box. You should have got down on one knee, Griffin. I should have got down on one knee. I should be doing this entire podcast on one knee in silence after my opening and just (laughs) sit there in one knee in what might be the most uncomfortable moment in the history of major studio filmmaking. Um, It's a tough moment. It's a tough moment. Yes, yes. But like, here are the here are the other quotes. No, no, don't read from the quotes page because all the other IMDb quotes are just about his assault. Like, there's only like six on there. Like, it's not even really. Yeah, well, yes, they're, Emily, they're no one very few. has yeah. done any, has paid any attention to this movie. Like, no one has gone into the IMDb Yet. page and been like, I should add some goofs. Like, you know, no one's Yet. done it. Uh, this Yet. sounds like you are creating, this yeah. sounds like a make work for <laughs> for the blankies out there. There's a pretty blank campus if you want to give it a shot. Sure. Like, Marwin, there's a lot of room to play around with on that IMDb page. If you want to start your own Angel Fire Marwin fan page, you could pretty quickly become the definitive oh, Marwin fan source don't online. Don't tempt me. I have too many things to do. That sounds Emily. really fun. Uh, <laughs> here's the other one. I didn't want to. It's it's too much back and forth dialogue, but this is the only other one I thought I could do. Uh, uh, Hoagie says, I like to wear heels sometimes. I don't know why, but they somehow connect me to the essence of dames. Does it bother you? And Nicole says, it doesn't bother me in the least. And his response is, Good. I love dames. He loves dames. He loves dames. He loves dames. Right. He's hoagie. Right. He's in character when he's uh, yeah. He's in the hoagie. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, man, what a, what a fucking movie. Do you guys know? I feel like often we joke about movies that don't exist. This is a movie that so <laughs> thoroughly exists. <laughs> it does really exist. I was going to say. Yes. It really exists, but it's daring you every moment to go like, just try to fucking process what you're watching right now. I dare you to keep this in your brain. Oh, I think it's wholly memorable. But yes. I think that when I think of a movie that doesn't exist, I'm when, and when you guys classify something like that, I'm largely thinking of movies that had a... Usually they're movies that have an advertising campaign that I, re- I uh-huh. remember really clearly sure. because that's all that I remember. I remember sure. the standee in the lobby of the, the movie theater and nothing else. Like, yeah, like, um, I, yeah, like X versus Sever. I would I would put in that category. Oh. But this one is one of those two. But uh, but I actually remember the movie. But because uh, for the longest time, I think it was at the AMC on 34th. Um, sure. They had the huge, huge standy, like a room size standy of all of the women of Marwin, life size. And I had seen the documentary and I was like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> like, yep. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I, I rewatched the documentary before this. The documentary is one of my favorite documentaries of the last 10 years, unsurprisingly. It's so uh, good. Very good yeah, documentary. Yeah, it's incredible. I also, also rewatched, yes. Cannot recommend it enough. And I will even say, if you're uh, uh, someone who has not seen the documentary and watched this movie in preparation for the podcast, I'd maybe even advise you to go watch the documentary before listening to this. Uh, it's an interesting thing to keep in your head as you're sort of listening to both. It's on Mubi right now. It's streaming on Mubi. It's a fucking great movie. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a great movie. You know what else is a great movie? And David takes a sip of beer. Welcome to Marwin, no, David. baby. Okay. That's, that's He's a great toasting. movie. He's Oh, the beer he's to calling camera. it right now. Yeah. He's calling Good it. Movie. David, oh, David's movie. taking it's a fucking a movie, man. Yes! Oh. What? Both oh. of you like this oh. movie now? Oh. Oh. I Hell just yeah. watched it before we started recording and I got teary eyed. I 
really got affected by this movie. I liked how much Steve Carell embodied like a down and out or just like a, a the kind of character you don't see enough. It makes you realize how Michael Scott is just two inches to the left of being an outsider artist. Yes. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look, um, I want to make this very clear. Ben is speaking with, with an earnest, clear-eyed passion, the likes of which we perhaps have not seen since the Spanglish episode. And David is kicking back in his <laughs> chair, yeah. drinking a fucking cream lager with a smug, shit-eating grin on his face. Like he's ready to fucking Cream go to bat for Marwin. He's ju he's just he's provocateur now. He's fucking Hollywood Hogan. <laughs> he's come to villain. He's holding a pinky to his mouth, Doctor Evil style. You you've been fucking teeing this up all week. You posted a letterbox score saying it was good. You've been tweeting about this movie being good. I've been dreading this episode all week. Dreading. He's been dreading it, dreading. I, I guess, because he doesn't like Welcome to Marwin, which is you a don't like good the movie. movie Welcome to Marwin, Griffin. Why? Everybody loves it, haven't you heard? <laughs> I wish the hottest I movie of 2018. Baby. Is it because you're a uh, toy boy? Is that what it is? A, you're too close got, to it. I got a lot of thoughts. I got a oh, lot boy. of thoughts. Okay, but We're let me just say this: it. I wish I had um, never crossed city limits. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd never um, even given them the chance to welcome me to Marwin. Um... <laughs> Griffin, Let alone twice. You yeah. should introduce the podcast, though. I'm realizing we haven't done that. No. Welcome this is, to Marwin. Oh, welcome to Marwin. Uh, this is a podcast uh, called uh, Marwin. Uh, it, it's a podcast <laughs> called Blank Check the Griffin David. I'm Griffin. I'm David. It, it could be called like Daygree. Day, day uh, Gr Griffid. Griffid. You know, if we like uh, did a portmanteau, right? Like, you know. Dave, Dave, and it, it would have to work Ben Dave in there and, and maybe Emily because the whole thing is it's like three names. It's so clunky. Yeah, well, Ooh. Marwin uh, Call, right, in the movie, right. not in the documentary. Right. But yes, yes. Well, but no, yeah, I mean, we'll, I will get into this. But uh, this is a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want to the degree that even 20 years after winning Best Picture, you're allowed to make this and release it Christmas Day. Uh, sometimes uh, those checks uh, clear, and sometimes they uh, b -b -b bounce. Uh, baby, because uh, this this is a big, big-ass bounce. Yeah, this is a solid bounce. I mean... Classic bounce. Yeah. A valiant bounce. David, right. you had said in the past, like, we had always been wishy-washy at the idea of being doing Zemeckis and then Marwin is like him daring us not to cover him on the podcast. Yeah. You did your Come impression on, on some Come episode on. of Zemeckis going like, look at this fucking thing. <laughs> like, like slapping the screen <laughs> and going like, you guys really aren't going to dig into this. You're going to tell me there's not a ton of shit going on here. You know, you know, it's like how like Rob Reiner, not that he ever was a Zemeckis level, but he sure. was he was a big deal director. Right. And he's like, eh, for the last yeah. 15 years, I don't know. It'll just be a movie. It'll be about some guys. They hang out. You know, like it's just like he's just sure, sure. winding down. He's just relaxing. Sure. And Zemeckis is like, no, 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 yeah. no. I'm putting it all up on the screen. Guys, I saw a documentary. <laughs> Let me tell you about this documentary. <laughs> what I liked about second. this documentary is how horny I this guy is. I went to South is. by, guys. <laughs> I just, I mean, this this is, as we're saying, a, a, a miniseries on the films of Robert Zemeckis. It's called Podcast Away. We're almost done. Uh, but I think it's important. I was just sort of clocking. So you go, like, uh, uh, The Walk and Welcome to Marwin, two documentary adaptations with Allied, mm -hmm. a fully original script in between. Then after this, he directs an adaptation of a book that's already been adapted well by an esteemed filmmaker, right? In the witches, Flight's yes, an original right, yes. script. Uh, and then before Flight, he does Christmas Carol, which is one of the most adapted works in history. And then after Witches, he's doing Pinocchio, which is also one of the most adapted works in history. There is something kind of hubristic about him being like, I should tell this story again. Like, he just keeps saying, like, no, I really need to be the one who tells this again. Yeah. It's all true. Allied all true. is the weird outlier in all that. 
but, but Allied and Flight are the two this like, is split like, swords. Yeah. yeah. Well, it seems with this one especially, he doesn't. He can't tell the difference between a curator's instinct and a creator's instinct, right? Because if you were like programming a film series yes. and you saw Marwin call, you'd be like, "Oh hell yeah, put that in! I love it." But like his instinct is like, "No, I I love it. How can I show my love for it?" I need to make right. it again, this which I think Hollywood is a common story. thing. Right. I think that's very yes. common, but right. yeah. Right. It's this, it, the classic sort of like upper echelons of Hollywood arrogance of like, I saw something I think is great. The ultimate tribute I can pay to it is to make it broader and yeah. more accessible yeah. to share mm-hmm. it with other mm-hmm. people rather than promoting the original thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can I just say, David, to correct you, our guest today, of course, is Emily Yoshida, uh, the great, the mother of Blankies. I was gonna. To I was hoping you would never time. say it. I was hoping we could get through this whole thing. That's, that's what, you know, the. You want to be anonymous the, the now? Hoffman Our guest bit. is anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, but David, I, I could just disappear into the background of the Marwin Bar, the 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 uh, ruined the ruin, stocking. Thank you, Emily. The ruined stocking. What I yeah. what I wouldn't <laughs> give to sit at a Marwin Bar right now. But uh, if I could just oh correct gosh. you, uh, David, mm. IMDb. Welcome to Marwin. Goofs. Revealing mistakes. Mark tells Nicole dolls cannot close their eyes. Yet there are some instances later on where Nicole has her eyes closed. A wow. goof. Wow. That's In a many big close goof. shots on Mark Hogan Camp's hands, the hands are not those of Steve Carell. Goof. I, wait, wait, is that, I don't know if that's a goof. Isn't that just a, a common filmmaking thing? <laughs> like, Revealing mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, now the movie's ruined. I, let's just all go home. <laughs> Folks, I don't want to alarm you, but this next one up is a character error. Boom. <laughs> the Nazis speak broken English? Fuck, I fucked it no. up. It's the Nazis speak broken German with heavy English accent, but it's not even written correctly. Yeah, also, I don't, look, 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 the goofs page is a nightmare. Someone's got to get in here. We need, it's like a super fun site. Like the federal government has to step in. The Marwin goofs page is no good at all. It's mad about using light (laughs) years as a unit of distance rather than a unit of time or something. Like, chill out. Um, welcome to Marwin. Welcome to Marwin. Welcome to Marwin, Emily. Say it every welcome day. back on the show. <laughs> welcome to Emily, who demanded this episode. Uh, Did I yes, demand, demand, demand yeah, it? Yeah, I guess early. I violently demanded it. Um, yeah, I would have taken so many Zemeck. I was, I was hard, hardcore on the Bob BZ campaign also. Sure. But it was, but I would have taken honestly anything, um, this one's fun because I was pretty sure nobody else was going to want this one. So oh. it, yeah. it is depressing to me. I'm very happy to have you back, Emily. Of course. I'm, you're, I'm happy you're, to be back. I mean, this your, is now family. my third thing in quarantine with you guys. Uh, Quarantine's really working out well it, for me. Well, it's, it's the second. Yeah. It's, it's the second, but the, the Mad Max episode came out when right, we were in quarantine. Right. But we recorded uh, it. But right. we recorded it. That, right that's what right. I was going to say. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. The thing I find depressing, very happy to have you back on the show. I find it depressing that we've been in this long enough that you've now made two appearances <laughs> recorded during quarantine when we yeah. try to not have people on two consecutive miniseries and you're doing the second to last episode on one of our longest miniseries ever. Yeah, this thing has gone on for a long time, it seems. Seems yeah. seems bad. Seems like Hot it should, take. Uh, yeah. Seems like we're all sick of it and wish we could record podcasts in person. Uh, uh, but then you watch more. a movie like this and you remember that we're all just humans and we have emotions and life is hard. Man, Thank I you like for this for bringing movie. it back to the film, Ben. Ben, who loved this Find yourself so in Marwin. God, what, Griffin, when are we getting a steel book of Marwin? Marwin, Marwin book. M- Marwin, uh, Marwin was one of the first movies to just have its like 4K physical media release canceled. Like it was, that was this period. <laughs> I like, feel like Universal. <laughs> yeah. Where they were just like, you know what? Is anyone going to buy this? It was like the beginning of studios saying like, maybe not every movie needs to get released physically. You know what I have oh to say God. about that, Griffin? What? 
cancel culture is out of control. Cancel culture is out of control. And he took a sip of his cream ale, by the way. It's not a cream ale for crying out loud. It's what a is Bell's it? lighthearted ale. It is a low calorie beer Does that it I feel occasionally light-hearted. sip on. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's doing so Dark much hearted. fucking smug prop comedy with this. He's using it to like fucking punctuate his sentences yeah, when he's like, he's holding, like holding it up it and up. shaking yeah, it right. <gasps> Cheersing his monitor. Yeah. Yeah. We see you. Like, like a hoagie <laughs> cheers in like his a, coffee cup at the bar yeah. at the, the ruined stocking. Um, I have to warn you guys that this might be, I mean, I don't know how, how many times I've been on this podcast now. I forget. A lot. Like, you know, I have the privilege Eight? of forgetting how many times I've been on this podcast. Well, but this and it is, is a privilege. Ooh, I'm glad you actually, acknowledge your privilege. Yeah. Um, actually, this is your 10th main feed appearance. If, if, we're, if we're counting Titanic as one episode, which we should. We yeah. are. What are. We're not counting bonus episodes. So no. So if we're but, you know including bonuses, you got more. But this wow. is your tenth main feed. Ten I'm sure no one digits, else. Baby. Yeah, Dang. The first one. Has done that. You're the first double digiter. Yeah, I am. Well, yeah. So everybody can eat my dust. But um, <laughs> but the, the other thing I was going to say is that like this might be the tenth appearance of of me, Emily, on this podcast. But it is. Probably only the second appearance, including the um, special features of Drunk Emily on this hey, podcast. So, we love to see okay. it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go yeah. get you're, you're a light, drink. You're lightly toasted, Emily. You're not drunk. Uh, but this is good. We're, we're, we haven't even oh. started talking about this movie yet. So, right. Right. And this right. is a right. two-hour podcast, and we're t- about... T- 15 minutes in, so. Fantastic. Ben, thank you for saying it's a two-hour podcast. I'd love to aspire to that. That's just great That's to very flattering. Aspire <laughs> to it. It's what it's been. <laughs> no, I'm saying two hours is 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 a good limit we, we, that we oh, usually sure, break sure, sure. through. Yeah, we're cutting ourselves off after that point. Okay. Griffin, yep. Griffin is gone. He, he's, he's unwelcome from Marwin, apparently. <laughs> now uh, we can knows? only look... At Mark and Wendy's nuptials in front of a gallery of hanged men. Well, I like that Emily is being upfront and emotional because it feels right for this movie. I am going to defend the hell out of this because it made me really feel a lot of stuff. And I can't stop defending it. I really can't. I think it's fucking awesome. I think it's fucking awesome. I I think it's a... I think it's, it's a, a fascinating movie. Yeah. It's a fascinating movie. Um, and a lot of it is, it works very well. Okay. So Griffin isn't here yet, but I'm just going to talk about this since you uh, saw this for the first time, Ben, and we're so into it. So I, as I mentioned to David over text, I, you know, knew I had to watch this. I'm staying with my mom right now. There's one TV in the living room. And, and I was like, I have to watch this movie for a podcast. I've seen it already. It's not that good. Like, you don't need to watch it with me. She's like, oh, right. I want to watch the movie with you. And I was like, oh, don't worry about it. I'll just watch it when you're busy or doing something. But then, you know, never, I was watching it this morning. Inevitably, she came through and ended up watching the whole thing with me. And then she's like, that wasn't as bad as you said it was. And I was like, mm. you know what? You're right. It wasn't as bad as I said That's it was. That's my exact experience. They were yeah. dunking on this the whole miniseries. They were like, Marwin this, bad that. But, it's, it's, but I think it deserves <laughs> Marwin to be. Marwin this, bad that. <laughs> I do think it deserves its. Oh, a cat. Um, Pig, you're in the way. Come on. <laughs> wow. Pig Sorry. is just. Wow. Pig is in the conversation. Pig has. Entered the discourse. Okay. Oh, All right. cat I'm butt. sorry. I'm um, sorry. But I was. I, but I was going to say that uh, I do think it deserves. This is not a qualitative evaluation, but like it should be this looming thing on the horizon of your Zemeckis journey. It is the thing that, oh, yeah. by which all else is measured, including like Back to the Future and yeah. Um, it's no. Forrest it's <laughs> it's almost <laughs> annoying that he made the witches. Like I'm sure the witches will be fun to dunk on or like dissect or you know. But like this would have been a great capper. Like this would have just been yeah. quite. Griff has arrived. Yep. He's opening something. All right, he's yeah, back. I got an entire there? bottle of wine. I'm not going to be the only sober one 
on a fucking Marwin episode where I'm I'm the minority opinion that this movie's demented. I need to be it's drunk. Busy night this is where at this the is ruined going. stocking. Whoa. We're all Griffin. tying one on. Oh my god, he's sipping out of the bottle. What are you <laughs> doing? I just straight up open a bottle of a fucking Griffin, white I'm not wine. saying the what? movie's not demented. It's not like I'm like, oh, this yeah. is a a carefully and sensitively made quiet li- you know, this is a crazy movie. This movie I is just, insane. I just um you know, it, it 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 gelled much more for me on my second viewing, if I'm being actually just so I, sober about it. For sure, yeah. It, it, now you're going to be sober? I just opened a <laughs> bottle of wine. You know what? I, I think I should be stone cold sober now. What? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Oh come on, come on. But uh, that's exactly what I was saying, Griffin, when you were out. Um, I heard it. I have my... I have my Bluetooth headphones on. I could hear what you're saying. I thought you were going to bring toys over. No. Oh, yeah. Here's here's, uh, Harry Dean Stanton. Hey. I love it. (gasps) That's a cool action picture. That was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's that great actually action. looks <gasps> really good. What a good toy. yeah, right, Griffin. The yeah, action, great? like the 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 figures, look so much like the the actors and act, like there is so good. Like the combo it's so of well done. Ben seeing Marwin and seeing that action figure gets Ben really into toys. Yeah, I mean, now he's all. What if Ben's becoming a toy boy? The merch spotlight. What about the, what about this guy? <gasps> Hey. Oh, wow. Hey. I'm just grabbing the three action figures closest to my desk at this moment. Those are good ones, though. <laughs> if anyone uh, wants to know how my apartment works, at any moment I can reach out and without extending anything other than my arm, grab three action figures. I've been looking for specific action figures for a present for somebody that I should actually hmm. discuss with you guys once we're not recording. But uh, Please. I've never gone into this world at all. And it's it's obscene to me. It's so it's crazy. Like how much stuff costs is it like makes me want to die. But here's, I'm here's glad my that guy. everybody's having a fun time. Oh, I love this guy. I don't know who he is. No, it's that cowboy, a, the little people cowboy. Yeah, it's yeah. like a Fisher He's, Price what little is person. That? Like right. a round it's a little, Lego. It's a little David. cowboy. Yeah, it's yeah, a round Lego. Did they not it's have little peg, people? Peg Did they not have little people in the ditch, Ben? <laughs> um, no, they th- no, we did not. <laughs> Isn't he cute? People know what I'm talking about who are not can't see this on the Zoom. They're like those little peg people that yeah, yeah he's, he's, got a little, he's got a little peg if you wanted to. Put we didn't even have stuff. Legos. We just had wood and nails. We just wow. well <laughs> hammered stuff together. <laughs> Two by fours. I That's mean, you know. right. That's uh, right. Anyway, look, there's not a lot of context on this movie getting made. I think most of the context is the real story versus this movie, which I I do feel like th- there. I, I try to avoid, I feel like, my tendency to do too much of the sort of one-to-one, like, this is the movie we're talking about, and this is what the thing it's based off of was like, and here's what they changed. But I think in this case, it is so fucking telling. Because for good or ill, regardless of what you think of the movie, it is a very Zemeckis adaptation of the material in terms of what elements he chooses to, to take from the real story and what he completely ignores or revises and it's very similar to Forrest Gump where he said like my goal was just to take away everything unsavory about this guy you know to just make Forrest Gump charming and aspirational and as weird as this movie and this character are it does feel like almost every story decision he made was to try to take away everything kind of unsavory about this guy which is perhaps a a fool's errand when the material is so fundamentally strange, the idea that at some point he could break this character into being like a very, very relatable audience surrogate is bizarre because he's a very, very specific man under very, very specific circumstances who operates in a very specific way. Yeah. I'm, I don't know if Mark Hogan camp, the real guy, is he unsavory exactly? Like what? How? I mean, obviously he's. Well, he's not a PG figure. No, he's not, not a PG figure. No. He's got a porn collection. I mean, come on. So does. And they don't, and so they does that, movie. You know. Yes, they I'm include fine with that. that. No shame. I mean, I, I understand what you're getting at, Griffin. Like, I do yeah. think it's a very Zemeckified version of. Yes. Yeah. But that's actually the thing that I find kind of at the same time admirable and completely doesn't work about this film is that like he does actually include a lot of this stuff. It's just through this Zemeckis lens with an Alan Silvestri score going over it. And you're just like, (laughs) 
the dissonance, the cognitive dissonance it's is crazy. insane watching it's this crazy. movie. Insane. Insane. Alan Silvestri, like, what did he, like, what did he talk about with Alan Silvestri when they're, like, deciding how to score him, like, at home watching porn? Like, Look, has Alan Silvestri ever so scored a scene of a guy watching porn at home? Wait, I don't... did they, at one point during the porn stuff, did they have the drumming? Like, the military drumming? Was that part of that? Oh, I feel like that's like a Deja thing. Like anytime Deja's around, oh, there's sure. like the snare okay. drum. I don't know mm. if that was during the porn scene, but yeah. Deja. I, I just, I find it fascinating that like looking at this source material, he was like, oh, I should go the walk forced gump route on this rather than the flight route. You know, because of, as you said, Emily, the, the innate cognitive dissonance that comes from so many of these story beats being done in like the house Zemeckis sort of Amblin adjacent style. It is so fucking bizarre. Look, I will I will admit I disliked this movie less than I did in theaters. I don't know if I can say I like it. There is more that I respect about it now. Uh, I, I When I saw it in theaters, I was pretty irate, which I think also has to do with my love of the documentary, of the real story, of Mark Hogan Camp's work is all obviously very much in my wheelhouse. Uh, So I think I was just sort of like so frustrated with how he warped the story in the way. And then, as you said, Emily, like the bizarreness of like, you cut that out, but you kept that in. Like at a certain point, if you're going to try to wash it that much, then maybe go even further away from reality, you know? Name, name names. What, what, come on, let's get into it. Well, okay. uh, well I guess okay. first we should we should just set up the very, I mean, people probably know, but yeah, the real Mark Camp was attacked, you know, outside of a bar who, let me, these guys let me unpack this because I could, I could talk about what's changed by, by doing this. Okay. okay? All right. Yeah, well, but just welcome to, say to Marwin people, as we should, Welcome to Marwin, you know, everybody. To welcome Marwin. to Marwin. Yeah. Welcome to Marwin. Uh, but uh, it, it, this, from the moment he comes out of mocap land, Zemeckis is at any point in time loosely circling four or five scripts, right? Like, I feel like he's just perpetually been in this state where every four or five months there's another announcement where it's like Zemeckis considering blank and then one project finally goes. And I feel like I heard this one rumored for a couple years before it finally happened and that it was going to happen with DiCaprio playing Hogan Camp. And then he went and did Allied instead, which was very much like a fast track Can project. You imagine DiCaprio. Cannot. Oh, it would have been interesting. No, I, oh, no, it would Cannot. not. Oh, my God. OK, anyway, that's <laughs> fascinating. I didn't know that. That's amazing. I mean, it, what's weird is I went, that's a weird casting choice. When they announced Carell, I went, oh, that actually makes sense. But we're going to have to talk right. about the weird state of Steve Carell's current career uh, within this podcast. But this is this is the the real Mark Hogan camp story. And then we'll get into sort of like uh, what the movie changes to it. OK. Uh, and the documentary, one of the many things I like about it is it it is kind of elusive. It's structured a little bit like a mystery without any answers because the guy is really not. Uh, does not have a lot of clarity on himself. So as the documentary goes on, you start to find out more and more about the guy and his past and all of this sort of shit. But he still really can't explain a lot of things. And there are a lot of question marks in his life. So there's something more elusive about the movie, which I think benefits the story. And when I say that he's unsavory, I think the thing that I like so much about the documentary, which is easy to do in documentary where it's a real person and it's harder to judge a real person as a character versus a fictional character being written by Hollywood screenwriters and played by a movie star. But he's got this weird rage within him, right? Which the movie character is very sort of wet blankety. It's this kind of corral wounded puppy dog thing that I feel like he's been yeah. doing in dramas yes. for the last five or six years. Right. I would say there's less of an edge to him, but it is, you also cast Steve Carell. So right. That might just right. sort of be what you're going to get. Right. All of it is, is off laid into the intense, like mostly machine gun violence in this film, right, right, which right. I think is actually just as interesting. It's like you have this wet blanket guy and then you see his right. inner world and it's filled with gunfire. Yeah, the the like, violence in this yeah. movie is what, Part a huge part of what turned me on to it, uh, yeah, yeah. and uh, you can just uh, extract that soundbite that I just said, I guess, and use it against me. <laughs> yeah. And I don't really know that I'm going to be able to 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 combat that. 
David? Yep. This episode is sponsored by our friends at Noom. Noom. We know them. We love them. And what are they? What are they talking about? They're talking about learning good habits, getting healthy, getting in shape, right? Absolutely. It's it's a sort of ha- habit building uh, app that helps you, you know, keep track of your diet or keep track of your exercise and keep track of recipes, things like that. Thing, any all kinds of habits. Now, this episode, of course, is on Welcome to Marwin. That's true. That's undeniable. It's a movie about a toy boy. That's also true. So I, I felt maybe for this audio exclusive medium, I should do a visual demonstration for this new Mad Read with some action figures. Please go right ahead. Look, the holidays hit, New Year's Eve. We've all been in quarantine for a long time, right? Mm-hmm. Some people might be feeling like this right now. Uh, you're holding up the thing. Big, big blocky man. Right, right. And, you know, I'm not saying that the ideal physical form is this. Forky, uh, skinny, uh, pipe cleaner hands. Too skinny. Yes. No, no one's saying you have to look like this, right? I'm not, I don't want to shame Forky, but yes, we don't all yeah. need to uh, hold up Forky as our thin spiration. But there's a good middle ground. I mean, there are many ways we can look. We could look like this. Uh, that looks like Sulu. Correct. Uh, from Star Trek, yeah. Yeah. Which is, you know, good looking man, fit. We, we could look like this. Um, wait, is that character from Alien? Yafit Koto. We should all look like Yafit Koto. Yafit Koto from Alien. Yeah. Uh, what's his name in Alien? Parker. Uh, no, um, not Parker. Parker. No, right? No. Yes. Parker? Yes. I mean, we're just going to have to Google it now because I can't, you know, let this go. Parker, you were correct. Yes. Right. I mean, look, and ultimately the ideal physical form is this. Oh, that's Robocop. Right. That's oh, how we, Rob, we all want to look. himself. But the point is there are many different ways we could look. There are many different ways we could live. And Noom can help you achieve whatever goals you want. It's not some one size fits all method. You might want to understand your cravings. You might want to try and get more energy and enjoy exercise again, fit better in clothes. Yeah. You might want to feel more confident in a crowd or a social situation or Zoom trivia night because, you know, obviously things are a little different these days. You might want to look like this. Uh, th- that's a chicken from... Um, wait, what's it's, the It's Camilla from? the chicken from the Muppets. The Muppets, right, yeah. exactly. Yes, um... Uh, you know, so Noom can teach you about eating, uh, you know, how to eat essentially versus like avoiding foods, basically just help you build habits. It's based in psychology. Um, you don't need rules to lose weight. You need knowledge. And it basically just gives you the health goals that are going to be right for you. Personalizes a weight loss program for you. It can help your aspirations become reality. It's a really easy app to use. And uh, they've got this sort of cognitive behavioral approach that is going to build the habits you need to keep the weight off uh, as you as you start to lose it. Uh, it's forgiving. It knows you're human. If you go off track one day, it's going to help you get back on track tomorrow. And it doesn't demand much of your time. It only asks for like 10 minutes a day. Yeah, and it's it's customizable to if you want to look like this. Uh, that's a gremlin. That's a spike or stripe. No, it's uh, one of the generic. It's a Christmas gremlin, a Carol and gremlin. He's got a he's fun. scarf and a hat. It'll help you look. You could look like this if you wanted to. Mystique, uh, as played by Jennifer Lawrence. Yes, of course. Yeah. That's actually the record of remain, but I understand Zoom technology. It's hard to see what it is. It could help you, even if you want to look like this. That's a, a screw from the Iron Giant. Right, not Just a screw. Not One a human form. single screw, not a yes. human form. Uh, there's a science to getting healthier. It's called Noom. Sign up for your trial today at Noom, N O O M, dot com slash check. You can learn how to eat again with Noom. Sign up for your trial today at Noom, N O O M, dot com slash check. If you're ready to learn how to live healthier, sign up for Noom today, N O O M, dot com slash check. When do they reveal that he doesn't remember anything from before the attack? Because it's sort of a late reveal in in welcome to marwin oh huh. then, i feel like that's pretty early in the documentary i feel like yeah because uh, it's in the Sorry, trailer my wife, I cut out for a second what was what was the question basically like when when his amnesia his sort of total amnesia is revealed in the documentary but i think it's right at the start when he's kind oh, of laying it out almost yeah. immediately i was gonna yeah. say that's yeah. that's such a big thing and that's so much of what i find kind of confounding about his adaptation choices is what part of the story Zemeckis chooses to represent, right? The documentary is obviously at, at the mercy of, they can only start telling the story at the moment the documentary filmmaker finds out about him. But he pretty early on in the movie recounts, I was beaten up outside of a bar by five guys within an inch of my life. And I had total amnesia. I remember nothing about my life. And I had to relearn how to walk, how to talk, but also relearn who I was, which I think is such a fundamentally 
fascinating thing that mm-hmm. this movie doesn't really deal with. There's the thing at the beginning where he's looking yeah. at the book with all the photos, the scrapbook, and it's sort of done in this sort of cute way until he turns to the page that is 18 newspaper clippings of the most traumatic thing that ever happened to him that yeah, he just looks one? at fondly. But also, he was a drunkard and homeless right. on and off okay, for a so, while, and they kind of just like, that happened. Yeah, they skim over the part where it's like, oh, he was probably an alcoholic before all yes. this. Like That's the fundamental intrigue of the guy for me in the documentary, which is he wakes up, he doesn't remember anything, he learns how to walk, he learns how to talk, he starts learning about who he was, and he realizes he doesn't really like that guy. Right? Right. Yeah. He, he barely feels that a connection to the person. Right. 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 And and there's this part in the documentary that's so profound where he talks to his friends and he's like, was I like an asshole? And they're like, right. you no, weren't like an asshole, but you were like a violent drunk. It was yeah. like scary to be really around you. drunk, yeah. Right. And it's like, was I mean to you? It's like, no, but it was like tough, you know, and he does have this sort of fear of who he was as like an impartial observer trying to piece together this man that he used to be that he has no memory of, but that he feels some sort of guilt over. Right. It's like a reverse kind of Robocop thing, which is probably why I like it so much. And there's that there's that fascinating thing of like he works at the bar and he's like, well, I can be like Sam Malone and I just won't drink. And just you're yeah. watching him next to all these bottles and you sort of have that thought of like, is, you know, what if this guy who doesn't even remember being an alcoholic had a drink and it just like, you know, right. turned right. away, you know, like there's that weird tension to that. That's that's very compelling. But is I it a Dr. Also- Jekyll, Mr. Hyde <laughs> thing? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Amor. But I, I think that I think the the inverse of that that's really mm-hmm. fascinating about it is the stuff that does stick around. Like he was an he was an artist and a pretty talented drawer, right. like just illustrator yes. before all that. And he lost his motor skills or the ability to both write and draw. But then he still has this like fundamental creative urge, which kind of draw, like leads him to do the Marwan project, which is one of those kind of inexplicable, like Oliver Sacks types. Like, what is the brain? How does it work? Right. Like, how does the shoe thing carry over? Like, like that, that's just a, rem- like that, that hung on and like other major aspects of his life didn't. And I think that, I think that a big miscalculation of this film is that it introduces the, it introduces the Mario Wynn project up front and 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 mm. that this is a guy who has a little village in his backyard where he does, has this sort of World War II fantasia that's like very like strangely kinky and like but he's just one of these guys who has a um a na- sure. a, a, a village he, in everyone, his backyard that's you know his everybody thing. every town has one of these well everyone's then, like oh hey, my town had work. one of these <laughs> I wasn't surprised at all. <laughs> But then, but then it, but then what it tries to execute then is the third act thing of like, so you know, you know that guy right in your life, but this is why he's like that, and like does right. the reveal of the amnesia, which like is completely unnecessary. Like I think yeah. it's such a specific pursuit, it's such a specific situation that if you don't lead with why it happened, you lose all the. That's like missed opportunity for gravity for that. For the entire two thirds of the film, I think hard ag- hard agree. And this is my second major gripe. The, the other thing I find so interesting about the story uh, itself, and and to your point, David, I mean, what you said about him wanting to be this like Sam Malone teetotaler in a bar, it's another one of these fascinating Oliver Sacks things where he's like, I woke up and I just had no impulse to drink ever again. Mm-hmm. There's no part of me that wants to drink. I don't feel tempted by it. It's sure. not just that he's like haunted by the stories he hears about no, what a yeah, drunk yeah, he used to be. Yes, right. Yes, he's, but he's, he's still an addict, though. The it, thing he's still reset. an addict. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 Sure. Sure. But but Zemeckis makes this movie ultimately about the guy needing to cut his pill habit, which is not yeah. something that is in the real story at all. Right. For all That's we know, the thing that is a a very unusual change and when i saw milk and marwin i was like i don't remember the pill thing is that in the documentary and so i went back to the documentary and i was like no i guess he just like wanted to make because deja the belgian witch plays is in it but she's not a representation of his meds the addiction yeah no well but that's because again he's not as clear 
uh, yes. anyway, really, except that it's sort of like, yeah, well, that's like my friend, and that's my, you know, like, and they'll hold up their doll, I, like you know, well, to, uh, in so, the documentary. Yes. Um, yeah. This is major point two for me, and it's building off of what you said, Emily. The thing I find so fascinating and so tragic about the story, and the thing I think they set up so well from the beginning, is that like this is a story of triumph in the face of our our ghoulish, inherently fucked. Uh, healthcare system in America, right? Right. That he yeah. he was abandoned by his, you know, he couldn't right. do much therapy right. because it ran out. Yeah. He's a vet who was yeah. beaten in a hate crime and then was told essentially like, uh, you're off the plan after like two weeks of rehab. You're on your own. Yeah. You, you can't afford this anymore. And he was essentially right. one of these guys who should have just fallen in between the cracks, right? Should have ended right. up just a, a complete victim of the gaping maw of our fuck society. Uh, and instead, he found this weird outlet. As you said, Emily, he was this amazing visual artist. He lost those motor skills. You look at his drawings in the documentary and they're like horrifying, violent things. Like they look mm-hmm. like the fucking band Appetite for Destruction album cover. Like they're like yeah. really, like clearly the product of a tortured psyche. Yeah. And he comes out of it and he wants to draw. He wants some way to express what he's feeling. He still has that creative thing you can't knock out of him, but he loses that and he finds an entirely new medium. This weird outsider art thing that comes through like, I need a hobby. The people at the hobby shop take pity on him. They start giving him stuff for free. He starts building stuff. He gets a broken camera. His camera doesn't have a light meter that works. So it's just trial and error. He shoots a bunch of pictures. He sends them off. They come back. He goes, that role didn't work. He does the whole thing again. He is not making art for anyone else. And it is not as much what this movie tries to present of like, oh, the guy cannot differentiate between his fantasy and his reality. It is, he is using this medium as means to process his trauma, right? He is very conscious about the fact, despite the fact, as you said, David, that it's hard for him to fully explain the narrative, even though it is clearly like in his head, he understands what he's doing. That it's like, this is my art rehabilitation that I was not given. I had to find a way to heal myself. He's a more childlike figure in the movie. Yes, he's an innocent. There's no question. However, right. Yes, Th- that's all true. I, like, and and Marwin Call is a great and interesting film, and his is a great story, yeah. and that's all like worthy of acknowledgement. But at the same time, Robert Zemeckis saw that. I assume saw the documentary, right? I mean, yes, like, I absolutely. assume that was what sparked yes. his interest, right? Yeah, and thought like, huh, this guy is you know his his little his action figures, his photography is. World War II centric. It's like this very old fashioned iconography, right? Like that he's kind of, you know, messing with and, you know, maybe inadvertently, maybe advertently, sure. you know, but like. That, that's a sandbox that you could just see Zemeckis salivating at. Right. Wouldn't it be crazy to use the power of movies to represent his trauma to make like an adventure movie, but also one that where like the war is is both like pretend and also like this okay. insane mental battle it's yeah. fascinating oh, 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 but Ben's also coming in hot. but oh, also boy. his trash mocap movies did he go well i can make right. the toys <laughs> right. yes. oh it's a perfect and, and outlet and it, for right. that it, yeah it doesn't have to look real right i it mean, can well, look, I, I mean it's I, kind I, of like heightened and 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 like over the top but it's supposed to like it it works for him i remember being at a bar with our our buddy rachel lang friend of the show past and future guest and her wife alex pitts friend of the show and i think while we were drinking this story camp on deadline like zemeckis sets next movie at the time it was called the women of marwin with uh Carell and I went like oh shit and they went what and I went like this is a documentary I love this is how wild the story is and they kind of went like that's a fascinating story why would he make like why would he remake that and I said like well what immediately comes to mind is Zemeckis wants to actually cinematically realize the narratives that this guy's created right that's like obvious that's the story potential of doing this as a big budget studio film is you get to actually tell the story in his brain and right. and my in my foolishness, I was like, I guess he'll do it like stop motion with like the dolls or you'll just see him acting it out. And then I saw the trailer and I was like, 
You fucking moron. It was just an excuse for him to take this mocap shit off the shelf. How did you not see that he looked at this fucking documentary and went like, oh, it's weird plasticky toys? And he like sculpts them to look like his people in his life so I can cast human actors in the double cast? We got ourselves a tap from Sims. A lighthearted tap. What? He did a little yeah. bit of tap. I just I, Davey, the, a cheers from the Davy Dog. Yeah, there there are a few <laughs> times I've been more ashamed of myself watching a trailer than that moment when the first mocap shot came up and I went, "You fucking moron! How did you not see that this was the plan all along?" Uh, yeah, I will say right. I mean, the man had made three movies where people were criticized for looking like action figures. So yes. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, these are the yes. two other beats I want to hit quickly, and then we can get into what Welcome to Marwin does. But the two major differences I think he takes from the the real story. Uh, uh, one, uh, he becomes this sort of like outsider art figure. He is spotted by a local photographer who recommends him to a friend who runs a Brooklyn art magazine, which ends up with him getting the gallery open that you see at the end of the movie. He's spotted dragging toys yes. Yes. along yeah. the highway. Yeah. I, I, the that sticks road. out. I mean, right. you know, that's noticeable. Right, and in this, he says it's like to get the treads with enough damage. I believe in the documentary, he says it's because he's trying to get the speedometer up to the right number on no, the Humvee. I, I, I thought, Am I, I wrong think, no, about I think that? It's, it, it's the same reason. It's he wants the treads okay. to look worn. He talks and about he, counting steps, though, like methodically how many steps he has to take per day. I guess so, but he he specifically explains like this this car now has X miles yep. on it, and if you right, like, that's what and it if is. this okay, this car sorry. is like a yes. one sixth scale, like if yeah. you extra, you know, he has like a whole thing on his uh, the in miles his head thing about is it. what threw me off. Uh, right, you're correct, right, right. Um, but there's so much of the documentary that I find fascinating because it gets into this like what I think is a really good match for Zemeckis with this material, which is like what is the human impulse to tell stories, right? Here's this guy who's essentially an outsider artist who started creating this work as means of like therapy and processing that then right. has this value to other people. And he is incredibly uncomfortable at the idea of sharing it with other people, of having to be judged on a serious level, of having to expose his personal things to people in that kind of way. There's a lot of tension in like the last act of the documentary. Uh, and, and it also is this idea of like, oh my God, an art opening in New York City I'll be like, I'll be normal in New York City. Like he keeps on talking about like Greenwich Village, like everyone there is a freak like me. I won't feel so weird anymore. And the most heartbreaking moment in the documentary is he goes to Greenwich Village and it's a bunch of like fucking people who look like us. And he's like, I don't know, I thought it'd be weirder. Like he goes right. to Greenwich Village <laughs> expecting it to be same like Lou Mark, Reed's same. New York. <laughs> right, Rude. right. Like that whole thing, which ties into the fourth major change they make, which is this movie goes out of its way to be like, no, 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 don't worry. It's just the shoe thing. Down to the line where he right. says when the guys threaten him at the bar, it's just shoes. In the documentary, in real life, he is a full crossdresser. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it is not as much cleanly defined as like, I don't know, I just have this shoe thing. Eh, yeah. Whatever, the shoe thing. It's a weird eccentricity. Sure. Because if you make it a shoe thing, it become it can become a Zemeckis toy that can it be can yeah. to eventually toy. stick in somebody's throat or whatever. Exactly. Like it, it right. can become a device instead of this very amorphous sort of right. Human right. It becomes thing. the clock tower or whatever. It becomes like one yeah. key piece of visual iconography that he can repeat at yeah. key story points. Yes. Well, uh, yeah. There's <clears> that. There's a moment in the documentary where he shows you the closet full of shoes, which is like replicated in the in Welcome to Marwin, mm -hmm. and like I'm sure right. Zemeckis was like, right, well, th there you go. Like that, that's a perfect image. Like, you know, there's stuff like that where he's like, yes, well, but you're, I mean, right. Mark Hogenkamp is there, there's a whole transformation thing going on with him in so many, yeah. which specs, which is fascinating. Like, I, I love it. it. I love yes, Marwood Call. It, I love it. It's, it's so deeper, interesting. It's more complicated. And I was watching, there's a really good Blu-ray release. They, they re-released the movie the documentary when Welcome to Marwin came out with a bunch of like extra footage they shot of him. And there were two scenes I was watching on the Blu-ray that really jumped out to me. There's one where he's talking about like his like trauma and his anger and being alone with his thoughts and like stewing on things. And uh, the guy says like, do you enjoy that? Like being alone with your thoughts? And he's like, no, not at all. 
And he's like, do you wish that you didn't obsess over things like that? And he goes, not at all. And then he stares out the window and he goes, look at me. What am I doing here? Talking to you like some kind of woman. And there's this weird, like this gets into the unsavory nature of the guy. He has this very weird relationship to women, Mm -hmm. right? He like very much objectifies them and sexualizes them. But then also he's obsessed with like the comfort of the emotional access that he believes women have. And the freedom they have to live an emotional life, which he feels like he cannot yeah. as a and fucking cl- man and in society. And the closest this movie gets to getting at that is that proposal scene, which I think yes. before we started recording, we're, we were saying it's like one of the most awkward scenes ever in a, in a studio Brilliant. film, which is true. But it is that thing. And it's the only and then but then Nicole kind of disappears after that scene. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. like this right. whole thing where it's like, you mean like. You bought that for the doll, not for me. Like trying to delineate and him kind of running up against that is yeah. is like that's the only time the movie addresses that as being, you know, problematic feels like an overused word at this point. But at least like yeah. not easy, not easy. I would say the other way the movie addresses that in, in it is in its many scenes of women annihilating Nazis with big guns while they're basically in their underwear in themed costumes, which sure. are the craziest fucking things. And they're all over this movie and they cannot so be bizarre. ignored. That is what this movie is doing. It is no, no, that da- is what's David, crazy. Yes. David, it's about the power of storytelling. It's about right. how sure. we're all we all wish that we could make movies. That's what it's about. That's yeah, all that but, it's about. That, that's the weird that, Zemeckis thing. Is you're just like that clearly must jump out to this guy. The the idea of like, oh my God, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. Even someone who doesn't think of themselves as a storyteller is innately drawn to using stories and fiction to make sense of their own life you know like and and the stories we tell ourselves and how people process them and all this sort of shit like that's the fucking Zemeckis thing of just like why do we make movies why do we do this and it's literally a guy manipulating little dolls in front of a camera this is right in my wheelhouse he's one of us he's one of me like it's just so right. presumptuous but then it's <laughs> weird that he makes this choice where it's like oh, no, he doesn't have that much agency over the act of creation because he cannot distinguish between... Sure, he's lost he's in making, the world. Yeah, yeah He's yeah. lost in the world, right. But, it becomes I mean, more this sort of Pan's Labyrinth thing. But why not get lost in the world? Yeah, I totally why not understand have it. a thing? Good for because, him. Yeah, um, what are you going to do? Movie, Especially in his position, he's got brain damage. He's going to just like work at a grocery store and his life is watching terrible television. Like he's got an <laughs> art form. He's got an outlet. Good for yes. him. I'm well, going to defend I love the art. this movie. I no, love no, but the art. You don't have to <laughs> sell me on the fucking art. Let me say my thing. Let me say my thing. Griffin, Griffin, let me say my thing. Do we like movies here? Oh my God. We love, oh my God. We love movies. I'm going to lose the thought. I'm going to lose the thought. I fucking lost it. God damn it. All right, don't worry about I it. I was Carry letting on. you okay, speak. Okay. I wasn't saying anything. It's okay. Okay, it, okay. I, I, I just want to, okay, so I'll, I, I'll say one thing, just jumping off of what Griffin was saying earlier, because this is one of the takes that I wanted to get out about this film, which is that I was listening to your guys' episode about Polar Express, a movie sure. that I've still never hot, seen, hot. probably will never see. Um, hot, hot. But, you know, whatever. I knew enough about <laughs> it that I could listen to you guys talk about it. Uh <laughs> And, and and you guys were talking about the idea of Christmas in that movie and it being this sort of, like, what's Christmas? Like, what is the thing that they're supposed to believe in? Obviously, me not having seen this film, I was like, well, it's the power of cinema. Like, that's what you're supposed mm. to believe in. Like, that's right. the belief. The it's like this, I, the idea of like, oh, you get on a train, it doesn't matter where it's going. It's just that you get on. It's like, ah, you sit down in a movie theater, you just watch the thing go. Like, that's that seems like a very obvious like, uh, I, I guess, analogy. And this is what brings me back to the Speed Racer episode, where I feel like we arrived at this conclusion in that film that felt like a real um, kind of eureka moment where we're like, it's about it's about the movies. Like it's about, it's about, it's about making art. It's about like, you know, being de- dedicated to a craft. And I think the Wachowskis talk about that stuff in a much different way than Zemeckis yeah. does for them. It's all about like integrity and like sticking to your guns and stuff for Zemeckis. It's about, you know, belief, the suspension of, of disbelief and all of that and, and believing in the magic and all that and, and making, you know, cobbling together a world, all that stuff. 
I just think that, but I, I think that this movie, I think this movie's fundamental fault, and this is a movie that I think is interesting, it has its merits, and like, is at least like a very interesting curio, if nothing else, but- Absolutely. But it is, it falls into this trap of, I think, any director of a certain age and a certain level of success where that's the only story they know how to tell is the yeah. movies. Like they don't know what else is interesting about the world. Um, they see the story of Mark Hogan camp and they're like, he's a, Oh, I can see he's how I filmmaker. like him. Right. He's a filmmaker. Right. He's it's a like, well, yes. well, yes. Uh, okay. But... <laughs> well, if I can respond, because I Please. don't, I think the thing okay. that you guys are not considering is that this movie is set before the documentary Marwin call. You know what I mean? Like, yes. if that yes. documentary is going to be made about this guy, it's going to be made in a few years. This is about well, the guy who hasn't yet testified at the trial. Like, it's he's still but the, in but it. But the like, trial is not part of the documentary at all. I understand that. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that the, the documentary is it's like, oh, wow, this guy went through this thing and is now like deeply embarking on this fascinating thing and like has a little bit of distance from the trauma and can talk about it, you know, like, whereas this movie is, is more about like, he's going to become the guy who gets an art show, right? Like he, that happens at the end of the movie. Like, you know, it's going to be a little bit ahead. Like, you know, so the trauma getting over the trauma is a little more part of the narrative spine. That's all. I'm not saying like that makes that excuses but, or that yeah, explains but I everything. I think it's not enough about the mer narrative spine because I think that this movie is set like a few years too late like i think Agreed. it should Thank be you. about creating the world about realizing exactly. that this is going to be how you do it like uh, coming I, I, up sure. with well, the okay. idea i mean yeah i, I, I remember I feeling this is such a distinct yeah. balloon deflation moment in the theater when it cuts from the first fantasy sequence to him setting up the photo and i'm like oh the movie starts and he set up the whole world perfectly like, right. isn't that the potential in doing a dramatic version of this story is this is what a documentary like filmmaker it couldn't capture <laughs> show the guy rehabilitating learning finding this discovering this maybe i'm just so resistant because of netflix and and all that too anything that will end at the start like i don't maybe maybe i'm just like no it's fine like it's fine that he's already built it but i know what you mean there there would be there would be that would be an interesting spine to him creating the world him creating the world is the extraordinary thing about him. Right. Correct. The extraordinary thing about him is not him connecting with a woman, which yes. becomes the real narrative driving force of the film. Like the show is this weird thing that's sort of abstract. It's hanging in the background. Uh, it's mostly like what's going to happen with him and Nicole. Um kind of taking for granted you have this whole fascinating, extremely unique thing to get into, which obviously they, they depict it, but like they don't. That's what I was saying. If they depict it, like I don't think they're taking it for granted. I don't know. I don't. I I just I, I feel like I agree with what you're saying, David. Fundamentally, about like end of Netflix season one is what yeah, should have like been now, the first ten and now minutes he's of the thing. Started on the road, and I'm like, yeah, okay, sure, <laughs> but, great. You but know. this movie could have spanned multiple years. I'm not saying it takes two hours to get to the point where he takes a photo for the first time. I'm saying. Right. You don't have to show every moment in real time, but why not start at the the discovery of the thing? The movie was originally titled The Women of Marwin, and to Emily's point, the marketing campaign was very much centered around the women. And like theaters had giant standees that were the women and separate character posters. Character posters, the, women. the whole And hog. you have a lot of big actresses. Right. It was like that kind of thing. And most of the women in this movie are fictional creations that don't even have direct analogs. There is a waitress character who in real life is an analog to the uh, Isaac Gonzalez character. Yeah. In the movie, she's Mediterranean in the document, Mediterranean, yeah. whatever her name is. I forget, you know, like she's somewhat yeah. similar, right? The Russian is um, there, but it's not based on a real person, right? In the Russian's life. not a real person. He doesn't have a caretaker yeah. like that. Yeah. He has male friends in real life. He has a former roommate. He has a best friend. And that one feels the least real. But but that yeah, one, he has that doll. 
He like that doll is one yes. of his dolls, but it's just not but, a. But there's Gwendolyn no real world Christie analog. doesn't bust into his right, house exactly. with a horrible Russian accent <laughs> right, in the right, documentary. Right. Horrible. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> right. I mean, he obviously had a physical therapist, but is not a character that is shown in the documentary at all. Right. She was not Janelle Monet with a metal leg right. being super cool. Yes, right. And, uh, so the, like, the documentary it, it, does have the character of Colleen, his friendly neighbor. Uh, who moves out of, before the movie starts. Well, Nicole is an entirely the, different character. Yes, because I think the movie did not want to subject the real person to sure. a romantic plot. So they, they actually acknowledge her. They say, right, wasn't she so nice? Right. Like, But they do not. They create a new character because, you know, whatever. They're they're giving it this romantic arc. And the, and the thing with Colleen was... Uh, she's married with three children and he right. is hyper fixated on the idea of being with her romantically. And there are these interviews with her that are very fascinating where she talks about like, you know, I understand he's a guy in a lot of pain and I want to be supportive. And I think this project is amazing. But my husband would always just say to me, like, be careful, like, be careful with right. this guy's interpretation of your interactions mm -hmm. with him. Um, yeah. And it's a very interesting dynamic that this film somehow neuters and also makes more disturbing in the Nicole relationship. Yeah, it's pretty weird in this movie, but it's it's both threatening yeah. exactly, but it's it's uncomfortable. It, Leslie's it, good. I though. will say, as the yeah, one, she's good. as 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 the one woman on this podcast right now, the one you woman of so, so full of dread about it. But it is like the most familiar dynamic in the world. Like it is right. it, yeah. any single woman knows what that feels like. Like when you realize, oh, shit, this guy's going to, you know, make his be my, or whatever. Be it's my like, mommy, friend, girlfriend, yeah, please. Yes. Yeah. And it's like and it's horrible because like, you know, you have to do the stupid thing of being like, we're going to be friends. And it sounds horrible. But I got you, know. you a Nazi toy. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, hey, I'm, I don't want to marry you, but sit, stay right there. I'm gonna yeah. get you a Nazi. <laughs> That's happened to me so many times. <laughs> Everyone in this movie keeps pushing that one Nazi doll on him. Merritt Weaver won't stop trying to sell it to him. Leslie Mann brings it to his door. Everyone's like, "You gotta own this Nazi." <laughs> so it's true. weird. It's, like it's true. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the guy's got a World War II city outside his house. I mean, you don't want a Nazi. You know, like, come on, want an enemy, buddy? All, she, all he's got is Deja, the Belgian witch. Another weird choice they make is that uh, the guys who beat him up in real life weren't, at least for what I know, Nazis. They were Are just. Are you sure about that? There's nothing in the documentary that mentions them having any sort Definitely. of Nazi leanings. Yeah. It doesn't, but I, I'm not sure. I don't know. That I don't just know feels like a tidy. Really. Yeah. That feels like yeah. a Zemeckis putting just be a tidy. little bow on something. It, it's, it's a Zemeckis, give them the flyer that says when the lightning's going to hit kind of shit. Like you can have yeah. the tattoo on their arm. Yeah, but it's also he wants everything to relate to them to the to the action figure world, like which obviously the documentary isn't concerned with. So there's that yeah. too. He's but trying yes. to do the Oz thing with it. But I right. that's like right. an example of just like so little faith in the audience of like I think we'll get that the Nazis in the world of Marwin relate to the assholes who Griffin. like beat an othered person. And this movie Zemeckis is like, is, no, give them swastika tattoos. Griffin, no, no. This movie is more complicated than that. It is not pandering to the audience. It is one of the most insane, hostile things in on the one hand. And then <laughs> no, also a super treacly. No, I, no, that's what I'm saying. And also a super treacly Hollywood Both. inspirational yes. story. Both. And it's all being mashed together in front of you at the same time. There's nothing like it. Like, it's not like. No. But uh, it paint does by numbers pander. thing. That's the strange yes, thing about it's it. Crazy. It does it pander, panders. even though it doesn't right. realize big picture. There's that it's not doesn't pandering matter. at all. But right. and the minute beat to beat things, it is pandering. It panders, but also Leslie Mann is like looking at a picture of her with her tits out that he drew, and it's like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> like while at the same time, it's like playing soft, you know, Alan Silvestri piano music. I'm saying no, this movie is discordant. It's crazy. Like it's an it's, insane it's a, film. Uh, oh, yes, bananas. yes. Right. We can't just be like, ah, oh, you know, he just Hollywoodified it. Like, no, no. This thing's this thing is bananas. David. Yeah, I'm feeling pretty proud of myself today. Okay. Well, that's good. You should you should be proud of yourself. You're a great guy. Just, you know, because I thank you very much for saying that. Um, 
But if I could boast for a second, I, uh, and this is true, I believe that I have created the most comfortable socks in the history of feet. I think I can wear that title with pride. I don't think anyone could even claim that they've come anywhere close to my accomplishment in terms of making the most comfortable socks in the history of feet. I think you might be forgetting about Bombas. I'm sorry. I shudder to think oh. how much work you put into these new comfortable socks, but there is Bombas out there. They've literally rethought every little detail of the socks we wear to make them way more comfortable, and I am wearing them literally right now. David, this is such a silly mistake. I This is a mistake I make all the time, like forgetting whether the door is a push or a pull. I love Bombas so much that I forget that I'm not Bombas myself. I, I feel pride over... The fact that Bombas has created the most comfortable socks in the history of feet. And I start to think, man, I must have done a really good job with these socks I'm wearing. Because they're so effortless on your feet. You just think they're a part of you. I think they're a part of me. And that makes me think that I must have done something right. The only thing I did right was ordering some Bombas. Well, here's what Bombas is doing right beyond that. They help give back to the most vulnerable members of our community. Because okay. for every pair of socks you purchase, Bombas donates a pair to someone in need. And the generosity of Bombas customers has allowed them to donate over 40 million pairs of socks and counting through their nationwide network of 3,000 giving partners. That's pretty crazy. Those yeah. experiencing homelessness, these spo- these socks represent dignity of putting on clean clothes. It's a small comfort, but it's especially important right now. It's a big deal. Bombas, of course, is a, a Shark Tank product. I mention it every time uh, we do an ad read for them because I think that's a real seal of approval. But they talked about the the creators of Bombas, that they realized uh, that among uh, unhoused people in shelters, socks was one of, if not always, the most requested item. And so that was sort of like they the cornerstone of their business. They wear out and they're important, as you said. It's both dignity and comfort and health. I've been wearing Bombas ever since they started, you know, sponsoring the show. And the socks, have, I there's no noticeable change in them whatsoever. <laughs> they're incredibly sturdy. And and you were, you know, you mentioned people in need. Uh, I don't know if you folks have uh, noticed this uh, bad uh, out there in the world. And the people who are in need right now are more in need than they've ever been. And this is this is a no brainer. You order some socks, you wear them. They look good. They feel good on your feet. And then you get to kick back and know, oh, man, my order of these socks helped give socks to someone who needed them even more. So listen, you can give a pair when you buy a pair and get 20% off your first purchase at bombas.com slash check. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash check for 20% off your first purchase. Bombas.com slash check. Remind me one more time because I, I promise this is the last time. D- did I make them or not? I'm still getting confused. No, you didn't it. make okay. them. Uh, Bombas did. <sighs> well, they did a good job. I remember in my re- my review of this, I, I did make sure to point because I do think that Steve Carell is excellent in this movie um and i i did you know call out the fact that i didn't think he was doing any of the kind of forrest gumpy type tics about being a special strange man like i thought it was such a it was kind of a like yes on the on the bad side like kind of just too soft of a performance too cuddly of a performance but i did it 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 felt interesting and there are moments where he does kind of take like some of Mark Hogan Camp's actual enunciation in a way that I like selectively, like he's not doing a full on impression, but like there's one moment at the end where he's like, is saying what happened. And he says something about like the Nazis were eliminated. He says it like that, which is totally something that Mark Hogan Camp does in the doc. And it's just like these little, it's a very, it's a very kind of dynamic and interesting performance. But I, I remember saying this and being like, look, this movie is weird as hell. I think this is a good performance. And people being like, I don't know. Like, it seems like he's just doing this, you know, uh, like the, the whole, I don't know. <laughs> what do we, what, what's the name of the <laughs> Ben Stiller and Tropic Thunder thing? <laughs> I don't oh, know. Simple but, Jack. Yeah. A simple Jack. Yes. Yeah, and, and I was like, I, no, I don't, I don't think that that's the case at all. But I, I'm wondering what you guys think about it. I don't either. I mean, I have issues with the performance. I want to make something very clear, David. I am not trying yes. to argue the problem with this movie is that he whitewashed everything. I think right. the problem with this movie is it's it's completely at odds with itself on a yes. moment to moment basis. Like it's I, a very weird yeah. oscillation between when he goes full bananas cuckoo pants and when he goes like I think I can make this play at a mall in Peoria. And it's that like is, <laughs> this weird dance between the two. That is how I felt when I saw the film in theaters. And that was I didn't even review it. It was honestly the movie just came and went. Like, you know, it was so ignored. 
uh, when it came out because there were other big movies and it just didn't work. It was out of theaters in a month. But when, I even remember the, you seeing it early and telling me yeah. it's the weirdest movie of the year. And I was like, right. is it good? Because I was excited about it. And you were like, I don't even know. It's it's right. like impossible to even quantify this so thing. Weird. It's so bizarre. Right. Yeah. Right. And the when I watched it this time, I more was like, I was surprised at how coherent I found it, considering I remembered in the theater being bored and wanting to crawl out of my skin. Like, you know, like that was sort of my theater experience. How were you it. bored by this yeah. movie? How um, on earth? <laughs> I think I was bored by how, when I saw it in theaters, I think I was bored by like being like, where is this going? And like the scenes of like, he goes to the courtroom and then there's a delay and then the judge is like, Ugh. well, it seems like this guy's a bit of a, you know, a bit of a problem. I'm going to postpone this sentencing. And I was just like, what are you fucking? No, no that's these people insane. are in that jail. So you don't insane. postpone <laughs> sentencing. Like that's right. cruel and inhumane. This guy who you know, suffered a horrible assault right, seems she's, to be a little shaken up right now. That's oh, the thing. Well, she's no just like, area. Area. they have swastika Stop inconveniencing tattoos. me. Right. You yeah, know, like, yeah. so I was right. just like, I think I was annoyed at that kind of like, whatever, you know, that, that, that typical, like we have to wait to get to. Have the you thing, even you know. been to court, David? You don't know. Yes, no. I have been to court. Yes, plenty of times as a reporter. To, yeah, as a reporter. Yeah, and as you a juror, been defended. Nah, you were on know. the stand. Wait, <laughs> what? <laughs> you were um, fucking wearing the the frilly judge robes, weren't you? I was Judging judge, everybody yes. around you. <laughs> um, I was the judge. I, I, David, I do have to reluctantly agree with you. I did find this movie a lot more coherent watching right. it now than I did in theaters. Yeah, I was not I bored definitely. in theaters, but I was perplexed and I could feel the whiplash from a scene yeah. to scene basis. And in this weird way, I'm not even necessarily saying this as an endorsement, but I have found very often when we revisit a movie for this podcast that I only saw in theaters and thought was a calamity. The second time I'm watching it, I'm like, well, yes, of course. That's how Aloha that's works. Right. right. That's that is the next. shape. <laughs> right. That is the shape of the movie. Right. The Book of Henry. I, right. I think I. I think I sort of drilled down more. Like, okay, he wants to explore the guy's trauma and the insane fantasy stuff is his way of representing it. And I, I, whatever. It just like, where, I mean, also, right. The first time I'm just like, what are these action sequences? Like, is this allowed? Universal was showing me the movie really early and they were like, you gotta be upfront with us about what you think about this. You can't lie. Like, you can't just give us the like, oh, it was interesting. Like, you can't just give us... To I be like clear, this performance. they were showing it to you because they were like, shrug, we don't know. We need to get yes. someone else's eyes on this. Can you just look at yes. this and tell us if this is anything? And you walked out and you were like, I don't know. I was like, uh, <laughs> boy, I don't think it should come out at Christmas. Like that was one of, <laughs> that was my biggest note. Um, it was think, supposed like, to come out Thanksgiving. And then they pushed it and they were like, we understand. We understand. It's not a holiday season movie. We're releasing it Christmas Day. What time of year <laughs> did Ed Wood come out? I feel like October. Because that's the Ed closest Wood. Co corollary yeah. to this, came I feel out, like, as and, far and, as... And it came Ed Wood out, also bombed. Yeah. It, it didn't well, do well. Yeah. It came out at the end of September. Yes, it was like okay, a so it was classic like first... Awards. Right, yeah, yeah. first awards movie of the season type. Were the gunshots yeah. really loud in theater? Because I um, will say, home experience, yeah. I felt like I had to go up and down because those sequences were so over the top and crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Would that I guess have affected I remember being your very loud in the theater. Yeah. Yeah. So Mac is a remember, big sound mix guy. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 there was that tension of like you were always like the scene in the courtroom when suddenly there's a life size right. Nazi action figure shooting. Right. You know, like the tension that it was about to switch was sort of the primary tension, like where you're like, oh it's you know something about to blow up or someone about to shoot a gun like out of nowhere, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It works in a theater. It It's interesting. Um, and also, it's I mean, Carell's performance is literally very quiet and the scenes yes. that take place entirely in reality are in a very quiet key. And there's well, obviously the treacly Sylvester score, but there are a lot of long sequences that are just like reveling in silence. Yes. Where it's just like extended uncomfortable <laughs> silence. We should talk about Carell. This is his post Foxcatcher run, which is just a lot of movies. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, Foxcatcher being where he gets an Oscar nomination, right? Like that's sure. 
supposedly God. he's leveled up, right? Like not only when is was he Foxcatcher, you could tell me that was in 2003. You could tell me that. Okay. Yeah. I was, yeah. Anytime. It was 14, 14, 2014. Yeah. Um, See, and that's, so after, that's an example yeah. for me. I feel like you and I have talked about this. Mm, I'm a big mm. Steve Carell fan. I always think he never got enough credit as an actor. Uh, sure. I think you and I both agree uh, he he arguably should have won the Oscar for Little Miss Sunshine over Alan Arkin that year. I think that's an insanely good performance. I, I don't even like that movie, but I think he's excellent in it. Yes. I think he's unreal in that. And then obviously right like, you know, after he makes that movie, before it comes out, he becomes this major comedy star. He becomes an A-list movie right. star. Right. We've discussed this a lot with JD in our text threads about how he has like the weirdest leading man career of weirdest. any A-list movie star where he almost exclusively plays assholes and creeps and like yeah. oblivious yes. losers. Right. I mean, if we're going to go back, you know, right. I mean, 40 year old virgin, obviously it is crazy, right? Like he stakes out territory with 40 year old virgin and I guess the office concurrently where it's like, right, right. this guy plays creeps and weirdos. And toy and, and his saving grace. That his like. saving grace is well, yeah. I mean, he's a toy boy icon, and we have to stand. We have no choice. But first six episodes of The Office, they're going full like smug asshole Ricky Gervais stuff. Forty year old right, virgin comes out, and when the greatest right. creative hail mary passes, they're like, oh, forty year old virgin. People find this guy charming. Let's split the difference. Let's give him some redeemable humanity. Right. Which is probably what keeps that show on the air and makes yeah. it now twenty years later. The most successful TV show of all time, I guess. Uh, yeah, I guess The I Office mean, is the biggest show in history. As a hardcore, you know, British Office fan, when the American one came out, I was like, no, well, this doesn't work. And then, right, in season two, when he makes that shift towards, he's more childlike than he is, you right. know, whatever, actively irritating. You're like, right, okay. He's yes, kind of okay, guileless. They, they found it. Yes. Right, yeah. right, right. Okay, so, right. So, post that, he's got like, they make they give him comedies. Evan Almighty, Dan in real life. Oh that's a, a, a quiet comedy. Uh, uh, get smart. Life. Hundred um, million dollars. Uh, Despicable Me. With These his, movies his do not exist. Oh, but like this Dan in real well, life. I feel like I saw somebody do a Halloween costume once of the poster for Dan in real life with, with the, the pancake in between the pancakes. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I mean, a hu- uh, the one that truly doesn't <laughs> exist is Dinner for Schmucks. That's the one where you're like, holy shit. But even that um, makes like $80 million. This is the yeah, point I kind of want to make is that flop. like m- right. these movies don't really about? have cultural staying power. It's about a dinner uh, for, how would I describe it? Um, these guys who are sort of like... Uh, Kind of schmucky. Okay, <laughs> sure, 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 sure. Schmuck, it, it. Um, schmuck. But my um, my point is, obviously, like Evan Almighty is a giant flop because it's the most expensive comedy ever made. But most of these much, movies right. end up between eighty and one hundred and thirty million dollars. Like he pretty yes. much only makes whether the budgets are too high or not. He is yep. a high grossing, consistent box office performer and as an A list th- leading man until Burt Wonderstone. Well, so okay, so through all this, he's also making the office. Then you got crazy, stupid love. Uh, another Big sort of makes eighty million dollars domestic. Hit. Yes, yeah. Uh, seeking a friend for the end of the world. That's an outright bomb, but whatever. Hope Springs, but also focus release. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He's he's Hope so Springs, bad in Hope Springs. I, kind of a hit. TLG rocks the heart house so of course, hard. TLG of in that right. movie. House is but on its Carole's side in that movie. Weirdly terrible in that film, and I like he's, him a lot. He's too much, right? Like, this is the thing. If he's too much, he can really ruin it. Like, if he's just... Incorrect. Incorrect. Hope oh, Springs he's not enough? is the harbinger. He's nothing. He's doing okay. nothing. Okay. He is so clearly in his head about not being Michael Scott that he has just drained uh-huh. himself of any energy. Okay. All right. Then you have Wonderstone. Like you say, that's just, that's just not a... That's bad. That he wants work. to do a goofball character movie. It doesn't work. Right. right. Uh, you've got um, uh, Alexander. Don't don't forget Alexander, the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Oh so this this that is when he's out. knocked down a ped. This is the thing Still- I find fascinating is like he has these films that all do well when he's on the office. And it's just like, Jesus Christ, this guy's working fucking hard. He's burning the candle on both ends. Right. And then he's like, I'm ready to leave the office. I want to focus on my movie career. And then all the comedies he makes after he leaves the office don't do particularly well. Oh my well. God. I just realized I saw Burt Wonderstone and you said the title and I could, I was like, that sounds familiar. 
That's, that's how I mean, unmemorable that movie is. That's, a, that's an ultimate movie that doesn't exist. Holy shit, that doesn't exist. All right, sorry. Uh, yeah. um, then he, that's the year of Foxcatcher. So he gets sure. an Oscar nomination. I think that's a pretty silly performance. I don't hate the movie, but he's I not like that what movie. I, like about it. I dislike that performance. Yes. Right. Um, and then so after that, right? Okay, the next year he has the big short. An right. undeniable hit. I also but think now he's it's, too it's much like in hard that. pivot. Oh, I love I, him in that movie. I, I think you know, he's I have, great in it. I agree I with both seen of it in you. Years. I think he's doing yeah. a lot, but I still like it. Yeah. I um, I like that version of Corell a lot. Sure, sure. It does a lot for me. He's yeah. very emotional. He's yelling. He's sort of the pulsing nerve of that movie, right? Like I, Bale yeah. and Pitt are playing these kind of like really quiet weirdos. Mm-hmm. Gosling yeah. is is doing his hey, uh, I'm Ryan Gosling. I was born in uh, Grand Concourse uh, Avenue. Yeah. What are you talking oh, about? Come on, like, let me get thing. a Frankfurter. Uh, <laughs> Coney Island dog. <laughs> oh, what I love is Brooklyn and the Bronx, Staten Island. <laughs> Queens, Manhattan. He counts form, them off one by one. <laughs> all, right. Um, all right. Apparently, he's in Cafe Society, which I have not seen. Yes. Nobody uh, can say. In, Nobody knows. He, Nobody uh, knows. Unfortunately, uh, I have seen that movie. I will say, not only is he in that movie, uh, not that I love spotlighting Woody Allen films on this podcast, but worth <laughs> noting, he is in that movie uh, playing like a tough mob like studio head it is the role that Bruce Willis was cast in and Bruce huh. Willis wouldn't learn his lines they fired him two days in and Steve Carell is playing a role that was built for Bruce Willis it is <laughs> so bizarre so bizarre I need, attention must be paid it is so bizarre Bruce Willis okay. showed up on set there are photos of him he shot two days they dropped him and they were like who's like the next Bruce Willis Steve Carell <laughs> So in 2017, he has two movies. Okay. He also has Despicable Me 3, but let's set that aside. Um, <laughs> sure. He has Battle of the Sexes, where he plays Bobby Riggs. It's a big, broad performance. I like him in that, and I like it's that movie. good. I, I think it's I a think, good yep. movie, and he's good I, in I it. Think, <laughs> yep. I agree. Thank you, I think he's... <laughs> I think he's doing what is asked of him in that movie, right? I, I, that's not I a agree. movie that yes. I, you know... Uh, and he's very well, much a supporting character. He doesn't need yeah. to carry like narrative weight. His job is to be a fucking showboater. Uh, Emma and Stone's then, great in that movie. I feel like that's a movie that, that has movie. been unfairly Andrea Riseborough. Riseborough's Two of them. good. Crazy I think old I Riseborough. fucking nominated both of them that year at the Blankies, or maybe I'm misremembering. But uh, the the Possible. strain of that movie that is just their romance, I think, is kind of perfect. And the stuff about tennis, I'm less into. Right. Um. And then he's also in Last Flag Flying, the Richard Linklater movie, God, uh, where, wet, which is the, the opposite. It's the yeah. just wet, nothing. He's just blanket. Right. He's so Devoid. sad. He's yeah. so quiet. He's like, it's like he's trying not to do anything, Any tics. you know, Michael Scotty, yeah. right? Like, yes. Right. And then the next year, he kind of does the same thing. Beautiful boy, which is nothing. He, which I, I guess yeah. he's he going into the negatives. Lines. He yells a lot in Beautiful Boy, right? Like, this, but he is playing sad man again. But yeah, these these like weird, empty, like ghost sad man performances right. that he falls into, which and, I find fascinating that it happens right. at the same right. Marwin, Beautiful Boy, Last Flag Flying, that right. all these performances happen at the moment when the office is having the second wind, and but, like every twelve year old is like Michael Scott's the funniest character in history. Right. And he's like, no, fuck you. I want to make Richard Linklater's least fun movie. Like I want to, <laughs> right. I want to make the heroin movie. Uh, but he is also in vice, a, a terrible movie, Awful. but I think he is actually good in it. I think he playing Donald Rumsfeld is more what the movie should have been. The movie is not on his level, really. Like it's trying too hard to be serious and about stuff. I yeah. think it should yeah. have been more cartoon, which is what he's doing. More prosthetics and impressions. Yeah, You've made this, this argument mean, in the past, David. Yeah, I think right. his opening in the movie is great. Like the right. scene where Cheney sees him speaking and he's so charismatic and that's, you're like, oh, these guys right. are like revival tent preachers. You that's know, like that's their whole appeal. Of. Right. Whole and then I feel sequence. like as the movie goes on, he deflates into sad wet blanket man again. Like I it, think the, of the end of his arc just, is him getting ugh. fired. Right. On and he's and just on nothing. With that movie. He's, it's whisper right. performances, I, right? Um, and then since then, 
He's only been in one movie, Irresistible, the John Stewart comedy that, let's be honest, turned the world in its head. It asked the questions <laughs> that no one dared ask. Um, David, you had one of the most all-time savage compliments in response to Irresistible after you saw it. Oh, Dad, you texted tell me, me and know. you said, Steve Carell has weirdly become more hot than he is funny. <laughs> It's like, my god that brutal. is so rude of me i know but i think about oh that a lot god. it is truly it oh has my god. these last nine months in quarantine it, it rattles in my head on a daily basis because i just oh, think so about interesting. it right because i go like it's so fascinating that this guy who was so beloved as a comedy star makes the transition to drama that a lot of these guys do which to some degree i think he's fundamentally sort of haunted by the fact that he never won the emmy right that he was never right. taken seriously on the office losing to fucking Shaloub for the eighth it, time right and it's crazy Parsons crazy for the third time it's never insane won the Emmy. right should have won the Emmy. right right. Yeah. right and so so he goes into this mode of like i'm gonna completely strip myself of all the michael scott shit post uh fox catcher nomination and be as dry as possible and it's weird that a he becomes so lacking in humor and B that he becomes really hot. He's become this fucking silver Fox. And even you and I were watching a couple episodes of space force, which is plagued with the same problem of like Corel. Why don't you want to be funny? But we both had to admit he's looking pretty good on that show. He looks he great looks good. right now. He looks um, incredible right now. The salt and pepper close cut hair. And I think, I think that must've been, I was also probably so bored during irresistible that I was probably like, yeah, yeah, Carell's half a snack in this. Like, you know, I just had nothing <laughs> like, else to focus on. Snack, he looks good with a yeah, beard. He looks good without a beard. Another movie I think he's good in and weirdly hot in, but also is very much playing against type is The Way Way Back, where he's just playing I've, I've never an seen asshole that movie. alpha right. male. Yeah. Right, Here's right. the thing. He has such an interesting dramatic career. I was thinking about it while I was watching this movie where it's like, I, th I, I feel like, and this is not a knock, but uh, I I think that it was one of these things where it's like, okay, he had, he really, I think he realized himself, I would imagine, that he had one essential thing that he was doing comedically that he could kind of modulate, but it wasn't, it wasn't a transformation. It wasn't different modes of being funny, which is like, I mean, not to say that lots of people haven't built careers off of that. That's not abnormal. But then I think, I think dramatically though, it's like, Unlike a lot of people, like I would say Robin Williams didn't suffer from this. I think like dramatically, he's also kind of more or less doing the same thing in every film. Yeah. But yeah. I really like that thing a lot. And that thing mm. works for me more than it doesn't work for me, even wow. in movies that I don't think are good. And I think it's this weird thing of like the kind of Julia Roberts of like kind of always playing yourself or whatever. But I think that whatever that note is that he hits, which is usually this sort of dramatic version of Michael Scott, like exasperated, sort of desperate and, and hungry for approval and like, you know, always on the short end of things like it always he's really good at it and it works for this movie and it's worked for I think. Yeah, I think like from whatever that was like, yeah, around Battle of the Sexes onward, I think. Right. 2017. Think, yeah. yeah. Isn't he a Chicago improviser guy? Yeah. Like, yeah. Isn't that he was Chicago guy. He was Colbert's understudy at Second City. And right. he was just that guy that everyone was like, this dude is so sharp. Why hasn't it happened for him? Yeah. It took a long time for him to get his break. He was on a he bunch was on of sitcoms the Dana, that were unsuccessful. Dana Carvey show. Right, Dana Carvey right, show. Right, yeah. He was on Which, um, I mean, it's, Watching it's, Ellie. Truly, right. yeah, some of the best uh, sketch comedy acting I have ever seen is from right. Carell on the Dana Carvey show. Um, and he was the on waiters the Daily who show, are nauseated by food obviously. is an incredible nonverbal performance for him. Yes, was on the uh -huh. Daily Show, but it definitely feel like I, I think the perception was, oh, this guy was so talented. I guess this is sort of the rut he found himself in. And then he right. like leaves the Daily Show, which I think was seen as like, why would you leave that? He was one of the first of that wave to like leave at his prime and be like, I want to pursue other stuff. He gets the yeah. Anchorman part which leads yeah. to him getting 40-year-old virgin as a Hail Mary pass. And, and the then he office. becomes an overnight movie star at 40. And The Office right. is shot before 40-year-old virgin, premieres before, second season comes after, all that sort of stuff. It's like a perfect storm. But it also speaks to this sense, like if you compare him to other A-list comedy stars, he hit late. Mm -hmm. Like despite the fact that he was working, 
his breakout movie was calling out the fact that he's 40 years old, yes. that he's right. too old to be doing this. So he too had like a fucking. weird narrow window where it's like a lot of these guys start out and they're the young edgy dude and then they have to settle into like the dad role in family films. And he started out being America's dad. But also to your point, Emily, like Carrie and Williams and so many other guys like that who like have the breakout, become megastars, and then are like, but I want to be taken seriously. There is, in their worst performances, this strain of mawkishness, right? Mm -hmm. The like the sad yes. clown feeling of like, mm -hmm. please look at my pathos. And perhaps despite not finding his dramatic performances overall as successful as you do, I do respect the fact that there's none of that sort of pleading, please like me, that he's just like, I am a fundamentally sad person Because those person characters are traumas. all pleading, please like me. Like, on, mm. it's in the text. Yeah. It's not subtext. Right. Like, it's, right. like, that's what he gets cast as more, more I, often I, than not. I believe it seems like none of us, including me, have seen The Morning Show, which is a uh, show I've been meaning to catch up on because, Emily? okay, you've seen it. Guys. Okay. Well, Guys, he was Emmy. Look, yes, I okay. watched I've been, all of the morning show. Okay, I've been meaning um, to is catch it up with the it Emily it seems show. Crazy. He, <laughs> he's playing a very unsympathetic character in that totally. show, is he not? Yeah. He's playing right. Matt like, Lauer. He's playing. It's a slightly softer. It's not quite as bad as Matt Lauer, right? Like he his sure. his mm, deeds were not as well, extreme. I don't. I the morning show. I'll show. Have to, I, okay, I'll have to watch it. I'll have to give it uh, ten episodes or however fucking long it was. I do think I do think that that it's it's I'm glad you brought that up because I think that piece of casting is like a huge deviance in this in this right. narrative. It's, it's, it is a bit interesting that he it is. is the it's it's like the one Carell thing I haven't watched that we bring up. <laughs> While bring we're up, on yeah. this podcast where three out of four of us are saying that Welcome to Marwin slaps. I'm going to just like oh, fully go out and say like, uh, I think the morning show kind of slaps. <laughs> That's <laughs> the wow. thing was. <laughs> the thing was when people when it when it hit you know when it uh, you know the first few episodes dropped people were like ah this thing just doesn't work by the end of it anyone who stuck with it was kind of like oh, there's something yeah. happening here you know yeah. so I've been meaning to get around to it David yep we all know about the grid the grid uh, the, the digital frontier right you know from the Tron universe right exactly uh, so you know one day. I got in. That's how Tron Legacy starts. Right, the grid. It's a digital frontier. You know, I mean, he tried to picture clusters of information as they moved through the computer. What did they look like? Ships, motorcycles? Were the circuits like free wheels? I mean, Kevin Flynn kept dreaming of a world he thought he'd never see. Thank you for talking to me about the grid. I mean, I like Tron Legacy too. And I, David, I have to be honest, I have spent years dreaming of a world that I thought I would never see. Okay. The purple grid. Oh, okay. you're talking about purple, right? I understand. It's a special kind of mattress with patented comfort technology that's the that thing. adapts to your body's natural shape and sleep style. Yeah, well, that's that's, that's a whole right. other grid. Right, because in purple, they're, they're committed to improving the way we sleep with their patented technology. You know, and it's called the purple grid, and it's the only comfort innovation that provides total pressure relief. One, absolute airflow. Two, an ergonomic support. Three. What's three? No, I said I was. I'm sorry. I was saying the numbers oh, after oh, I, I said I, the I, thing. I, I, I did oh, say all three I, I, things. I postmarked I was on the numbers. Hooks. I'm sorry. I'm that so was, sorry. Yes. That was a mistake. Yes. Yeah. They, these mattresses have like 1,800 open air channels, so it neutralizes body heat. It's got a nice cooling effect that you other mattresses cool don't have. Because they cool all night. Yeah. Um, and the they have a pillow too, engineered with the grid for total head and neck support, absolute airflow. You're always going to be on the cool side of the pillow. It's proprietary technology. It's been innovating comfort for over 15 years. They sent us some of this grid. They sent Griff. us the grid. We got you these remember. little. I can. Fun I can to squish. Right. I can like put an action figure on it. It's like an action figure size bed. Yes. It's a little grid, but I also use it as a desk toy. But it's also very comfortable, and you can try every purple product risk free with free shipping and returns, and they have financing as low as zero percent APR for qualified customers. So if you want to just like see what this thing is like, I know it can be hard to picture. Uh, you can just you know check it out. It's risk free. That sounds great. What's the catch? Uh, there's no catch. You can there's, there's none. You can experience the purple grid and you'll sleep like never before. Go to purple.com/slash/check10 and use promo code check10 
For a limited time, you'll get 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash check 10, promo code check 10 for 10% off of any order of $200 or more. Terms apply. Sounds good. We should probably swerve back to Milk and Marwin because there are probably yeah, let's some go through scenes the plot. we want to um, dissect. Right? So yes. uh, we start on um, Creepy Guy in his yard. Um, I'll say I, I actually fully love the opening of this film. I think the so opening cold open adventure sequence is the most successful. And then I really like the juxtaposition of the hard cut to this guy just silently in his backyard doing this. I, I felt like I was such a fan of the story, was very dismayed when I saw the trailers, sit there in the theater, hoping I like this thing. The first 10 minutes, I was like, fuck, is this actually going to pull it off for me? And re-watching it, I was like, god damn it, is Sims going to sell me on this being a masterpiece? <laughs> it's good. Well, no way. I'm not trying to say it's a masterpiece. I just, it went from like a two to a six. You know, like, it's fascinating. Anyway, yeah, sorry. It's a Carry rich on. six, though. It's a very rich sure. six. Very rich. The richest six. Oh, my God. It's a, I could eat that six for breakfast, lunch, like and dinner. Six. Yeah. Yeah. Thick. It, thick it is a thing thick. I like thick six. about... Corell getting to play Hoagie is it feels like him giving this sort of like second city sketch comedy performance version yeah. of a like pulp World War II movie hero, you know? I, like it, I you really, feel that comedic yeah. energy from it. Yeah. He's good as Hoagie. He's like he's funny. Really good as Hoagie. In a, right. Yeah. It's, yeah. He's good. It's as true. somebody who hasn't of Hoagie? watched the documentary and, yeah. and I watched it with my girlfriend, Nellie. We are like, shout out. We are like, oh, he's doing this CG bullshit. But oh wait, actually, <laughs> this is working. Right it now. works. This is working. It I'll looks like this. trash, but it's supposed I, he, to look like trash. I think it looks. Oh, good. I'm into this yeah, movie. Right. Actually, holy I, shit! Wait, this is emotional, and this is like a great story, and this character is so unique and fucking different. <laughs> holy shit! What the hell is happening? And now you're into the fucking movie. This movie was I made for this. like like thirty some odd million dollars, somewhere between thirty and forty. I think, yeah, it was about forty. At that, right? Yeah. At that budget, with this much motion capture. It's impressive. I yep. will say they, if I can just petty gripe here, I think of a thing, you're all going to boo me when I say this. It is the most predictable, cliche, fucking Griffin action figure nerd thing in the Jeez, world. She set it up some I more, I think the thing you? this movie succeeds wildly at for the first time in Zemeckis' motion capture career is you actually feel like they are successfully capturing the facial performances of the actors, right? You watch yeah. this and there's like nuances in their micro expressions and you're like, it's making it through the pipeline. Unlike Polar Express where it's being fucking dulled, like you get it. You, you really feel like you're watching these actors, you see the choices they're making. If I can gripe for a second and I understand no some budget limitation, you. I do feel like this movie does not quite capture the tactility of the toys themselves. I Boo. think it has a very odd relationship to the physics bathroom. of the action <laughs> figures. <laughs> Emily's Please, leaving in protest. Go. Oh, the toy talk. Um, yeah, but they, I think that's uh, okay because they're sort of half real, right? Because he's putting that's himself the into argument. these things. Right. Right. That's the um, argument is how much it's like, I, I get into this territory where I feel like obviously just talking about shit. I love the toy story franchise, but also the Lego movies, oh, interesting. I think are very good at owning the physical limitations of how that toy was constructed to give characterization to the characters through their body language. Right. And to find like creative yeah, outlets yeah, yeah, yeah. for gesture of expression. And this is a movie where, because of the design of these types of dolls, 12 inch closed action figures, you have like visible joints, right? And you yes. have like fabric that's bunching up in a weird way because it's on a small scale and all that sort of stuff. And the movie very often chooses, I'm just gonna get all this shit out of the way while Emily's in the bathroom. <laughs> Very often chooses to rather than have them conform to the articulation points on the doll that are visible, have them just move like a normal human being. And I think if you I look at the Lego movie where they're the like, there are only four points where they can move 
And you even yeah. look at something like fucking Robot Chicken, which is animated with like Mego dolls, which is our slightly smaller scale, but have clothing like this. I do think they play pretty fast and loose with like how much can they bend. Right, and then they'll sometimes in- choose their moments where it's like, oh, his neck turns all the Are way we around. Are really talking about this? Stuff? Okay, I'm yeah, done. I'm done. Stop. You're cool. yeah, no, I'm he was, done. Done. Griffin was getting that was the out timer. of the way before Griffin. you got back. The timer was Emily in the bathroom. Okay. I got it. Okay. Out of but, but the other thing is, he's not yeah. playing with the dolls in the way that the movies you're described, like Lego movies, which is actually I, about yes, kids. I understand. I, no, I, I'm just saying, like he's he's yeah. he's pouring himself into these things. And sure. so, it, you know, because it's not just that the toys moved. There's explosions. Yes. You know, there's there's blood. There's, you know, they, there's all these ways in which they behave abnormally. But then he does. He picks his comedy moments where it's like, oh, the head turns the around. The head turns like around. 108 yeah, degrees. Right, right. They fall off and they split and in half. Sometimes they have blood and viscera and skeletons. Yes. Sometimes their arm just goes pop. Yeah. Right. I kind of love it. I love any time. Say, I'm, I'm sure that you said this while I was out, but any time they just get knocked over and they're dead and then they are just a toy. That's Didn't like the greatest that. effect. Um, Didn't yes. say that. I like that. I wish there was a little more of that because I do think there is value to owning the limitations of them. Yeah, because that makes end. it like Lego movie. That's that kind of right. fun thing of like, this. Is, these are toys. This is why it's fun to play with toys. Emily, you're, you're That's repeating my his points. We're done with those points. They're, they're in, I they're should in the never past. should have gone but to the bathroom. I'm it. sorry. I love no, it. Now okay. you're making me and look it's fine good. And it's acceptable. Okay, so just to shout okay. out the women of Marwin, just to, 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 to name them all. <laughs> Run you got, them down. You have Announce Le- them Le- as Leslie. if they're the 97 Chicago Bulls. <laughs> Of course. They right. all yes, accept right. him in a way six, where you're six like... Six-two from Oklahoma. Let uh, Ben Leslie speak. Mack. Let Ben They're, speak. I, they Let all accept okay. him in a way where you're like, okay, they know his deal. But it's crazy. Let's do this. I have I no think, context. I, and I didn't I watch this the documentary, idea. by the way. So it's just Most like, of these women don't exist like, in the documentary. Most of them have no further right, context which, in real life. Yes. I would assume because it's impossible. But everyone is just like, hey, this guy has a fantasy and I'm I've bought into it and I'd like to hear updates about it. Like David, here's, and I'm here's also a segment a I'm gonna force. Here's a segment I'm gonna force to happen right now. Name a woman of Marwin and I wanna get Ben's reaction to that woman. Okay, so you got Leslie Mann as Nicole. His new neighbor. She's a redhead action figure in the Marwin universe, the Marwin verse. Uh, she's the new comer. She's uh, so nice. In real Almost life, she's too nice. nice. Oh, too boy. Nice. It's, uh, Leslie's doing a great job, boy. Oh, boy. It's hard. <laughs> Leslie, man. Close personal friend of Leslie, man. She rarely no, plays. I feel that for character. her in those scenes because mm-hmm. yeah. I'm like, she's smiling so hard, and I like it. But man, is it tough to watch! It's, I feel like it's the, what you yeah. said, Emily. It's a very standard dynamic of man yes. with poor understanding of emotional boundaries, misinterpreting base and kindness, and yeah. a woman trying to figure out how to assess. The risk level of the guy. Yeah. How? What's the risk of not being an asshole to this person? Right. While it's also like, drawing boundaries. Yeah. yeah. Also, her ex boyfriend. That shit's crazy. Oh my god. Yeah, he's but he is a cop. on the guy's he's fucking a porch. Yeah. Cop as hell. Okay. Next, we've got Merritt Weaver as Roberta. Oh my god. Who in in real life is the the hobby shop employee. And uh, in but let's the in real life, world, the hobby shop is owned by an elderly couple. Right, this character yes, does not. Exist. I know, but in the movie, in the movie, we're going to yes. be in the movie now. In yeah, the I movie, understand. she's the hobby I shop understand. owner. I understand wanting to replace almost any character or duo of characters with Merritt Weaver. It's totally yes. fine. Like Zemeckis should make a mocap Merritt Weaver movie where she plays every part. She's. The best in this movie. She's, she's so good in this movie. Like, she's always good. Has she ever not been good? But is she know. into him? No. Uh, well, yes. yeah. I, in, yeah, absolutely. She plays I that mean, pretty I, genuinely from minute one, I would say. See, she's, Emily, she's, Emily yeah. said no. I can't no? tell. You guys are a psycho. No, she's not. She's just what? his friend, right? So yeah. sure, sure. I, yeah. I okay. think she's very emotionally invested. She is. In him. She's emotionally invested. She's yes. not like doesn't 
want to like go home. Okay. With yes, I agree a hundred percent. I was like, is That's interesting. he's half a snack? I'm just saying. No, he's, a he's not a snack. I have viewed that as a failing of the movie. He's in a backyard playing with toys, David. But I haven't considered. Hey, I haven't considered the possibility that maybe the movie doesn't want me to think that she views him in a romantic light. Because in theaters, I was like, how dare they try to sell me this bill of goods? You mean that they're going to get together at the end? Yeah, yeah. I was like, I was I was pretty pissed off at that. I think that the note that they hit on the end is the only acceptable note to hit, which is if if, if everybody's being honest in that scene. I know we're skipping to the end of the movie now, but we're just just like, we can try it and we might like it or we might not. Which I think is very in keeping with how that character would handle that proposal mm-hmm. of a dinner date, you know? Like, right. sure. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Who, who's to say? I might I might enjoy it. I might, you know, there might be something there. Like, but clearly in the moment, not feeling that anything's there. Um, in, in the Marwin verse, she has a big shotgun. I just want she to point deals that out. with yes. her topless moment in a very funny way. Where she's like, yeah. I have no shirt on. What's going on? Yeah. That's the right. weird Zemeckisiness of this movie where he's like, no, nah, oh. I want like several scenes where they litigate how uncomfortable they are about the fact that he undresses their dolls. <laughs> where are you guys in general at this point on Zemeckis's like I, feelings I, on sexuality? I'll say his, this. His, I, I, his boob obsession? The man likes I, boobs. I, I cannot figure out Zemeckis in general. I have rarely gotten to the end of a miniseries or near the end of a miniseries and felt like I have this little of a read on a guy. He He's so slippery, but the sexuality is the element that eludes me the most. The yeah. guy is horny. Yeah. I feel like two He's or horny. three episodes into this miniseries, someone on on the Blank Check subreddit summed it up perfectly, where it was like that one horny moment in every Zemeckis movie, and it was like a, a cartoon of someone hitting a dog with a rolled up newspaper and going like down boy. It was just like, there's always one moment where he just goes way too fucking hard. Yeah. And I just want to say about his sexuality, the, look, the man is a boomer. He makes boomer movies about boomer people and he likes big jugs. It's it's like the most <laughs> basic ass boomer opinion. Like he's just, he literally would go to a store and buy like a big jugs magazine. That's how I perceive Robert Zemeckis's uh, Excuse me. Opi- that's feelings like about sexuality. You don't think he, he would- likes like I don't I yes. don't I don't know anything about like how his blood runs, you know? Like well, that I've, that's a complete I've seen mystery. his wife and I've seen the roles he gives her in his movies. That's that's yeah. a lot of where I but anyway, we're getting to his wife cuz especially have- in his digital movies. He likes the backdoor yes. bodacious babes as Mark yes. Hogan Camp would say. Exactly. Next oh. we have Janelle Monet underserved, I would say in this film. Yeah. Uh, really? as Julie his uh, physical therapist this who has a metal after leg. after Moonlight or like... Yes. Moonlight two years, and Hidden Figures. Two years after? The, yeah, but this is the, her first... Or one, I can't remember. ...film appearance since that year, right? Uh, yeah, that's 2016, right? Yes, this is right. This is 2018. Yeah, but this is and, and of course... Yeah, uh, she shows up just to talk would, about rocket fuel. Ironically, she would then be in Ugly Dolls, another movie about dolls. Oh. But these wait, you're telling me these dolls are hot and those dolls are ugly? Just saying. Uh, what do we think of Janelle Monet as Julie? There's the, not much to the, say, honestly. Yeah. There's nothing I, to say. I I love Janelle Monet. I'm so yeah. in the chair sure. for Janelle Monet. Uh, I love her as an actress. I love her as a musician. She's probably the last concert I will ever go to in my life. Uh, but uh I, I just felt so much excitement out of that Moonlight uh, Hidden Figures year. And this was like the immediate follow up. And I was like, I'm just excited to get any glimpse of Janelle Monet on screen again since she's announced that she's apparently America's hidden movie star and character actress. And it's just kind of frustrating that she just sort of is there. Like she's yeah, got it feels like- 15 seconds on camera live action and just a lot of mocap sort of group scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You have Isa Gonzalez, an actress, I got to say, I always like. And who, like who just kind of started popping up and stuff a few years ago. And I always I always like her uh, yeah. as Carlala, the uh, her the fellow meatball crafter at the bar. 
A person Mark's who would never work at that bar ever in the no, ever absolutely. ever. It's certainly it's not possible. in the kitchen. In the it's, it's no, yeah, it's, it's so weird. You see, <laughs> but, it and you're like that. That's you're you're also an action figure in this kitchen right now. They they would make her a mascot of the restaurant. They would install yes, like yes. a fucking lard lad donut sign of her outside the top. I think but by I do the like time it gets to her in this um in in this movie, and I do th- I I I I generally like her too a lot. Um, but this is like the most unfortunate part I think of any of the yes. of the the women of Marwin. Uh, Apart from maybe Leslie Zemeckis, but we're getting to her. I would say that Gwendolyn Christie is the other close. Ooh, one, yes, but that's one, another contender. One, yes. But this is the one where I feel bad for Isa Gonzalez in it because I think she's like much better than this and like and i think this is well whatever we should go through all the rest of them i haven't i I think she's putting a lot into it though like i do kind of commend the sheer force of will she is trying to apply to this underwritten very thankless role right she wants to be mark's fun friend at the bar like she definitely is trying to invest as much reality into that as she can right a a genuine finger of unconditional support and empathy listen though like I'm just going to say again, like playing this note of humoring somebody just to like keep them harmless around you yeah. is something that I think like, oh, wow, like women in Hollywood are good at playing that. Like, it's right. just like a very like it's a very familiar dynamic. Um, and I think but, they all do it well. And I think like she does particularly. But yeah. Great yes. point. This is a thing I particularly <laughs> like about the documentary is that you get to watch Mark Hogan camp, like tell his perception of their relationship and then cut to the woman and be like, uh, uh, sure. You know, and this yeah, movie does right. not grant narrative agency to these women in real life, but whatever. No, n- maybe Leslie Mann slightly. That's about it, right? Uh, none of them else. None of the others have like scenes on their own. Well, uh, I I do think though, like I I, don't, I I'll just say this in brief though. I do think that. By the time you get to the scene with with uh, Carlala, come on, Carlala. Uh, yeah, when you when you get to the scene with her and she's sort of like, oh, and then what happened? And then what happened? Like you know, like a- asking him about everything. You you kind of get past the feeling, the sneaking feeling that you might have at one point. Like, oh, is he trying to do this? Like a kind of, is this like a turbo? psycho king of queens type thing where all these hot women are like so fascinated with this guy but then like by the time you get to her you're just like it's almost weirdly a it's like what if that times a thousand like it's just like this it it, it feels like almost like a commentary on that kind of dynamic sure sort of interesting it's just like no all his friends Right, yeah. are these hot women who he could turn into Barbie dolls with machine guns? Yeah. yeah. Also, this um, whole town treats him and his eccentricities the way that like uh, Pee Wee Herman's town treats him and Pee Wee's yes. Big Adventure. There's that. <laughs> right. Oh, the local eccentric who we all find equally harmless, despite the fact that he's got some <laughs> weird, un sort of observed undercurrents. He has full on S and M tableaus going on in a church in his backyard. <laughs> right. <laughs> You have Gwendolyn Christie is Anna, Anna, his Russian caretaker who Rough bustles stuff. into his house once a month to bring him groceries, I guess, and oh, pick that's up believable. medicine for him. They seem like they're, yeah. that's been going on for a while. That's some rough Hand stuff, deliver a, an oversized yeah. bottle of pills and then immediately tell him not to take those pills. And uh, then don't leave. have too many of those. Okay, I gotta go. Like, you know, yeah. Um, so she's there. Uh, obviously Gwendolyn Christie, a statuesque woman. Maybe that's why Zemeckis was drawn to including her. I don't know. But she just looks regular in doll form. She doesn't right. look like <laughs> Gwendolyn Christie. They should have made her a bigger doll. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, Diane Kruger, who I will say looks a lot like the real Deja, the real uh, yes. um, Hogan camp, which I may just be that Diane Kruger has this angular striking face. I don't know, but like when you see the Marwin call thing, you're like, oh, that's wild. Anyway, Diane Kruger, no real life comparison. She is simply Deja Thoris, named after the, the you know, the yeah. villainous character from uh, John Carter of Mars. The Belgian witch of Marwin, who is a time traveling Nazi spy who represents. Uh, pills. Yeah, Addiction. medication. And uh, also reliance his, like, on pills. Isolation. Right. His inability yeah. to. Depression, I guess. Like yeah. she is the, the, the dark. Illness figure right who who ruins things and 
shows up at the worst time and kills anyone nice who comes to Marwin, right? Like, I don't know. Yeah. Can I say, there's the weird thing in this movie where, like, he goes to the store and he's like, I need a redhead doll. And the Merritt Weaver recommends a doll that already looks exactly like Leslie Mann. There's the fun angle to his real artwork that he's using dolls of, like, other famous movie characters. So in the documentary, his mom is a big figure. Right. Right, Steve McQueen is, like, another guy in town. But his mom is a big figure who's not a figure at all in this movie, a big, like, support figure in his life. And he's like, uh, I gave my mom the pussy galore doll. I know it sounds weird, but it, it looks like her. And then the other women of Marwin are like Drew Barrymore from Charlie's Angels, and Kate Beckinsale from Van Helsing. I, of course, was able to identify all of them. Right. You were more on that than me, right? I, I definitely. But there is that funny moment in the documentary where the the waitress, the Mediterranean waitress. Yeah. Demands She's like, I'm on a hot cheat. boyfriend. <laughs> Right. She dumps one of the dolls. She's like, you have me with that guy, but there's a Steve McQueen. I want to be with Steve McQueen in your fictional universe. So she has given Steve McQueen as a boyfriend. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, The the hoagie doll, by the way, is Nicolas Cage and Wind Talkers. Uh, (laughs) Sure. Right. 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 Uh, Cage could have done this. That would be interesting. Yeah. I mean, Cage would have done a lot. Yeah. Um, Leslie Zemeckis as Suzette the French lady who in the, in the, in the world of welcome to Marwin is a porn star that Mark likes to crank it to. That's who she is. Like, she's not a person that we meet. He doesn't know her in real life. You see him watching the video as the fake porn star that Mark likes that Mark then transposes into. She's in that video. Yes. That's who she is. That's who she is. And that's the wife. Yeah, that's fun. Uh, and this right? is speechless. Yeah. <laughs> this Who is also after plays Leslie Zemeckis the barmaid. Plays, right. Yeah. In oh, Beowulf, oh, I, uh, how could I forget? Um, and the burlesque puppet and Polar Express. That's right. so weird. Yep. It's crazy. Respect. Big jugs. And let's just say that's, that's Le- what Zemeckis Leslie Zemeckis, say. filmmaker on our right, has no. directed, I believe, two feature length documentaries about like the history of burlesque arts. Absolutely. This is clearly an actual field of interest and expertise for her. It's just crazy how he leverages her. Yes, right. exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. It is weird the way he inserts her into the films. Yes. But maybe they're both into it. I have no idea. Maybe she's like, I want to play, you know, a fake porn oh, sure star. I don't, both. Yeah. It seems like right. I mean, it's happened enough times now. <laughs> right. Yeah. She's done three documentaries, Griffin. Uh, yeah. Wow. Behind the Burly Q, Bound by Flesh, and Mabel Mabel Tiger Trainer, which that one might not be about the world of Belarusk. That might be about a tiger trainer. Okay. But the first two definitely are. And they're good titles. Yes. Good titles. So that's The Women of Marwin. They're all over this movie. You gotta love uh, them. You, you gotta love them. They got machine guns. They murder Nazis. They're kind of invincible. They like to hang out at the ruined stocking. Do you, am I missing anything here? Well, that's... So your whole sort of take, and it is the thing I really kind of keyed in on watching it again this time, you know, having an understanding of what the movie was going to be, being able to, like, sort of burrow into some of the weird pockets of it. The The weird hyper violence of all the Marwin fantasy sequence does feel like, as you said, is tied to some sort of like dominant, submissive, you know, give power to the women kind of thing. I feel like in his original work, in in his Marwin Call work and how it's presented in the documentary, it's very much my read on it is that he feels very threatened and judged by other men. And by the expectation of how he needs to believe as, uh, behave rather, as a male in front of other men. And there's a quote in one of the deleted scenes I watched that like really jumped out to me where he talks about um, uh, wearing more thorough drag, not just like the shoes. And one of his friends, his male friends who's in the documentary is talking about like, oh yeah, like he, he wears drag in front of me the first time I was kind of surprised, but now I'm just used to it. And then they cut to him. And he is talking about, like, the second I get home when no one's around, I put on the stockings, I put on a skirt, I put on the shoes. Like, that's my default. And he said, I get all chilled out like women do. I can think deeper like the more logical species. And it is like he has this, like, weird reverential thing of just, like, women are serene. 
They are like warrior angels. They are completely balanced and powerful. It is unhealthy in its own way, but it is fascinating. Uh, and it it's a does kind sort of, of objectification s- still, though. That's the whole thing. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Absolutely. Which I think oh, you the found documentary. It. Oh, I found it. I think the there documentary is. reckons with the weirdness of his reverential objectification in a way this movie doesn't. But yeah. David, your argument obviously is that the movie Those scenes is, are where that's happening. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. The, the, the film is not textually commenting on it in dialogue amongst characters. Right. It is just presenting this absurd, overcranked thing to you. And this is right. Why the, the, I, yeah. yeah. Well, I ha- and I hate to do this more than once on a movie because I just hate this in general as a form of criticism. Like, I never want to say like what the movie should be other than what it is. But I came away from this movie the first time, and I still feel this feeling like my my ideal Welcome to Marwin adaptation. If Robert Zemeckis wanted to do it would just be to like let Mark Hogan camp write a screenplay and then, you know, maybe put your Zemeckis touch on it or whatever. But like, I would just want to see if he's given a budget, like what is the story that he would want to sure. tell? How Give far us the straight, right. uncut, completely kinky, yeah, hyper violent right. type shit. Like I want to see that movie very yeah. much. <laughs> Sure. Like, but that's um, ironically that's a Crispin Glover movie. That's like right. that's Crispin Glover being like, right, take the camera. We're gonna do this together. Right. Well, you know, right. I should say this movie written by Zemeckis and Caroline Thompson, who of course was, was a big was Tim Burton, Tim Burton collaborator. Figure. Right, but um, is like wrote, a family wrote, film person. Yes. Yeah, yeah, wrote wrote Edward Scissorhands. She wrote uh the first Adams family. She wrote right, you know, she's you know, Corpse Bride. Night before uh, Christmas, Corpse Bride, Nightmare, but then she also yeah. directed Black Beauty. She directed and wrote Black Beauty and, and I, Buddy I think as also well. Also directed and wrote Buddy. Yes, exactly. Right. right. So she was um, a burden yeah. person and then went on her own, did uh animal family films, but is is largely family film person, did City of Ember. It is an yes. odd choice for Zemeckis to bring her in to co-adapt this work with him. It yeah. is. It's and fascinating. I'm a big fan of her work. Yeah. And it's her first screenplay in 10 years. I, I have no idea oh, what wow. the story is there, how they knew each other or whatever, but it's fascinating. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I uh, just wanted to mention her. Um, uh, Emily, I think that's an incredible uh, uh, angle. I mean, that's the thing. That I'm sounds fascinating. Now angry at the Emily. movie. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. right. Like, I mean, obviously, because he's so compelling. Yeah. And I want to yeah, see, you know, it's so like compelling. you you come away from watching Ed Wood, you want to watch an Ed Wood movie, you know, like yes. you just want right. to see, like, okay, I got an I I got an artist, another artist interpretation of of how this guy, you know, what makes this guy tick, but like, I want to see now the uncut thing. I want to see the primary source of. Yeah, you know, Ed Wood's an interesting thing because it's obviously he did not go through the same, you know, extreme you know, point in like this crazy traumatic incident. But right. like, that's another movie that is Hollywoodifying and sort of sanding off the edges of a totally a, a, yeah. a strange person. Yeah, it's like the most obvious comparison for me because right. mo- otherwise this movie is and the, the without comparison. <laughs> right. Right. But, <laughs> right. but how yeah. often do you see Hollywood deal with weird people? Never. I just like it, it, it's, it's so a, refreshing yeah. to me and to not just be the butt of the joke and to be the the sympathetic central figure right. of the film. Yes, yeah, correct. right. Yes. They're not the comedic foil or like the punchline. They're just that. That's who you're following. I don't know. I it just no, it was I really agree with you, refreshing, and I enjoyed that's it. That's what I like about the movie, Ben. I mean, I do not disagree with you for a moment there, but that also gets to what I like about him as a figure, you know? But like, but that's, it's interesting because of course this movie was pitched in its advertising as being from the director of Forrest Gump, right? Like they were very much yeah. trying to be mm-hmm. like, you haven't Robert seen Zemeckis. the world until you've seen the world through the eyes of Mark Hogan camp. Yeah, exactly. He invites you to meet another incredibly Which unusual I, person. I believe much more than that line about Forrest Gump, honestly, <laughs> like oh, that's yeah. the thing. works for me much yeah. more. <laughs> I, I might argue, I find this movie a little more dramatically compelling and less uh, mocking than Forrest Gump. I, many I, would I probably love- not agree with that. But yeah. I was mocking up my rankings and it's a real squeaker, David. <laughs> Isn't it? Isn't it? I was yeah. also mocking up my rankings and I was yeah. like, oh yeah, the, the back half of this is interesting. <laughs> like there's a lot yeah. of decisions. Yeah. 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 I think, I, uh, think that, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I didn't realize that the co-writer of it wrote 
um, on Adam's family because I think that, mm. you know, I, I would say, Ben, that I think that most movies are about weird people, actually, but it's just like how they treat them. That's the thing that's important. And I think that I, I yeah, would like say a war that, hero like Captain America, such a weirdo. <laughs> he's pretty weird. That guy. He did so like, weird. Get frozen. That guy's though. different. Something's going on with that guy. Something yeah, weird just happened to him. But also, um, no one loves Thompson America wrote, that much. The Hulk is <laughs> very strange. Um, Caroline Thompson wrote Edward Scissorhands, which is the kind of ultimate modern weirdo, I'm a weirdo. as a strange hero. Strange digital man. Yes. Right. But I think, but I think that Adam's family, and I say this also, as somebody who. Uh, has watched both the Adams Family movies like maybe three times in lockdown. Too perfect, of course. Um, too perfect, of course. Uh, You're a smart I've, person. I've also, You're a smart fucking I've, person. I, I think I've watched each of them twice over the last nine the, months. The last yeah. time I watched Adams Family Values while coming down off of acid, and it was great. Um, but uh, but I, <laughs> yeah. I but I do think that the Adams Family is like an, it's interesting to know that just because I think that that. That those movies are about deviance in a way that is a very Hollywood treatment of deviance, but they are fundamentally about being not just a little weird, but being outright yes. offensive to most people's yeah. sensibilities. Yeah. And and I finding think, right. yeah. What's finding your people so successful them. about the Adams family movies is that God it has it. fun we have with to it. Do oh, we have to. But oh, it has yeah. fun with it. <laughs> You know, and they they're they're fun, sympathetic people, but it also the door is open to anything. Oh, and yeah. you are allowed yeah. to imagine to anything. Like child they're murder. into all of it. Like, exactly. Right. <laughs> they like it all and they can joke about it. And you're like, huh, another funny joke. And it's in the movie's like, yes, it was a funny joke, but it's also what they think. And both of those things could be true and you're going to have a good time. And like, it just pulls that off. Like it's impossible. It pulls it off. But also we can't yeah. go into a full Adams family tangent here, but it has to be noted. The masterstroke of those two films is that they're a great family. Like they really right. are loyal and supportive other. of each other. Yes. Right. Like I, I feel like I've seen so many people tweeting recently about the fact that like Gomez and Morticia were the first time they saw an adult couple oh. on screen and realize that married yes. people could still be attracted to each yeah. other and, and that's still feel the whole passion. Gag about them. They're like, right. they're like, it, it's all opposite day in the Adams family up to it, including like, what if a husband and wife really liked each other? Like right. that would be the they craziest thing zero in the world. flame. Yeah. Right. It's, yeah. oh, they're so good. Those movies are they're so masterpieces. perfect. They rule. Yeah. They're, they yeah. are masterpieces, especially <laughs> values, which values is just is perfect. Incredible. I mean, it values, is, values, values the Rosetta Stone for our yes. right. We watched that together, I think, when I was at like, your, yeah. Was when, you were, when you were at my place, I was like, I'm throwing it on. And we yeah. watched it and Hell we laughed yeah. every minute. Yes. <laughs> every it's, single uh, joke gets a laugh. Yes. It's so it's, it's the only live action movie that feels like peak Simpsons. That feels like season five yes. Simpsons, where right. there's just actual emotional underpinning and right. also just fucking joke density and creativity you tweeted this recently david but like when we finally do the adam stanley values episode it's going to be delivered off a of balcony of vita style <laughs> like you're like at this point <laughs> it is like going to be Mussolini, our grand yeah. gesture to the people yes 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 exactly <laughs> Oh my God. I, I believe I also, I once treated like my ultimate fear. I know they did the cartoon. So the cartoon kind of blunted this because the cartoon can exist without me worrying about it. And there's but a like, sequel coming out one next day, year. It, right. But to some one day, there'll just be some deadline article that's like Zach Efron circling Adam's family. Like, you know, like just like, you know, it'll, it, someone will get their claws in it where I'm like, no, no, don't do it. Don't bring it back. You can't yeah. be famous. You won't Am I misremembering? I mean, my brain is soup at this point. Was it not announced that Tim Burton is going to do a live action Adam's family TV series? Wait, what? Oh God. Good oh, I feel like that was a deadline announcement two months ago that he's doing a TV show for the first time and he's going to be the showrunner. Which is a horrible uh, idea in every regard. Yes, you Am are I correct. Wrong? This is this, you are Thank correct. You. This is a, a you know a whatever in development. Who knows? And and right. the, and the worst part of this is if you ever were to do it in live action again, the two actors you should cast are the people they've already burned in the animated movie. Oscar, Oscar Isaac, Isaac, and, and Charlie Theron. Played, interesting, Charlie Theron. Huh? Yeah. Right. Impossible to top Julia and Houston. Just impossible. You can't. Uh, the the teaser trailer for Adam's Family 2, so which is tentatively scheduled to come out next Halloween 2021, mm. is just like 
thing crawls onto screen, snap, snap, and then it says next year things return to normal. And then thing okay. like pushes the letter A on and it says abnormal, snap, snap, the Adams family too. I, I just want to say for our listeners who can't see the zoom. So, so Griffin is doing this with his hand, but he has the background. <laughs> so he's doing the thing hand, but because of the zoom background, it is actually severing his hand from his arm. So it's really like good VFX right now. Good. <laughs> I'm actually keying out my hand, but I just, I was like blown away by that where it's like, oh, this is the first teaser trailer that is not just trying to hype audiences up at the prospect of a new movie but trying to hype them up at the prospect of a pandemic being defeated yeah <laughs> right that's, that's like next year strategy right next year Come you outside. might be able to see a movie again snap yeah. snap <laughs> yeah um do we have anything else we want to say about marwin and being welcomed to it I, I took truly two pages of notes. I'm looking through them now. I had so many thoughts while I was I mean, watching that's, this. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Jeez. Um, Griff Riley, you really come with this. notes. I know. I've been doing it more recently just because my brain has become a fucking jello nine months in and I cannot retain mm. a thought for more oh. than five seconds. Can I do a quick shout out to uh, the documentary that Jelf Malmberg and who is the other director? Oh, yes. Um, that movie they, rules. Spettacolo. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's fantastic. If you like Marwin Call, I would check it out. It's about a town in Italy that does a play about itself every year. Uh, so it's similarly the sort of like self-reflexive art project in the way like it kind of scratches that same itch, but it's like this huge ensemble and this like decades long story about this town. And it's fan- it like it moves me to tears that that documentary is amazing. They're, they're great. Yeah, they do a good job. Yeah, they're all. Um, uh, yeah. Malmberg also edited uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor? I didn't yes, realize. He, until oh, I was oh, he does wow. a lot of this. documentary editing, I think. Yeah. Whatever. Um, yeah. But he yeah. rules. Uh, Marlon Call is great. Uh, I always get the title wrong, but Tapacolo is great. Uh, watch both of his films. Um, th- this is, the, uh, I, I think, the only note I didn't really cover in this. I mean, A, I'll just recite this verbatim. When he shows the shoes to Leslie Mann, and mm-hmm. she goes, so is it like a shoe fetish? And he goes, it's not a fetish. And his clarification is, I collect women's essence. Helps mm-hmm. me understand dames. And her response is, hmm, mm, I get that. Mm, I get that. Is I'm sorry, uh, is uh, Jodie Foster about to burst in here? Are you going to put on night vision goggles? Mm, Am I, I about that. to go in a well? Okay, I don't mm. get it, but also, it, come on, guys. I, I had to do the Silence of the Lambs bit. I have no problem with yeah. a foot fetish yeah. or a shoe thing. If you want to be no. into that, that is a okay. I don't it, give it a shit. It's okay be weird. Only the issue of the way he says it to her. That's the only it's problem here. The way here. that she just, reacts. Right. Response. It's just yes. weird energy between them in the scene. Correct. Yeah. Uh, a bohemian like you uh, to uh, Mark Hogan Camp waking up in a fever sweat, and then this weird morph edit to him running into the bar to get the lava lamp. Uh, I, we haven't watched Witches yet, but I would argue the single weirdest needle drop in the entire Zemeckis filmography. <laughs> and it's I a filmography full of... That? What? Yeah, it's great. It's I love it. so bizarre. He's, he's going dandy war holes. What? It's when, it's when Deja says, you must build me a time machine. Yeah, and he's he like, a time store. machine? And it goes... Duh, 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 Vegan like kicks food. Off the, the Come over from, to your pad yeah. and I'll do some, something nice. <laughs> My God. Is that the most recent song that you think that yes. Robert Zemeckis yes. has ever heard? Yeah, because like, we can watch all these movies rips. and like... Flight, the most recent song, is from 1979. That's incredible. That, for Wait. him to pull up a Dandy Warhol song Whoa. is so bizarre. Griff, there are needle drops in the film Flight? What are you talking about? I don't know. Here's the thing. The score's not totally diegetic in that film? Like, just, just, you know, the sounds of the universe that we're hearing? You might not know this, but uh, John Goodman's character in that film has sympathy for the devil. Um, Okay, but what about, like, when he does cocaine? Like, is there anything up with that scene? Like, David, I There's no songs about cocaine, so. I I Uh, hate to tell you this. I hate to tell you this. It hurts me to share this. But in those moments, one could argue that uh, Denzel's character, uh, Whip Whitaker, is feeling all right. (sighs) (laughs) You're right. I'm feeling all right, guys. Uh, Last thing I want to share. Yeah. 
And this is just like the fundamental, my frustrations. And to some degree, I'm just hung up because I love the documentary so much. It's hard for me to view this movie on its own merits. But I talked merits. about the documentary when the end, the denouement of the film is him going to the opening in New York City, being terrified about having his art judged when it is never meant to be something consumed by the public. And he's like trying to hype himself up. You're like, I'm going to be in Greenwich Village. Everyone's weird. They're going to have feathers in their hair. And then he goes there and he's like, this is boring. This is so unusual. And there's this shot of him wearing like leather men's shoes. And he's like, I hate, I hate that I'm wearing these shoes. They look nice, but I chickened out. I'm such a coward. I should have worn them. And then you see him at the opening when people are starting yes. to leave. And he goes up to one of the women who's organizing it. And he says, I'm so ashamed of myself. I chickened out. And she's like, it's not too late. Put on the heels. And then there's this beautiful cut to him wearing the heels and mm -hmm. his stockings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah. I did it. And they're like, see? And he's like, it, it does feel pretty good. And that's like the big point of the movie is like, even though he's disappointed that like New York isn't the haven for like acceptance yeah. that he thought it was going to be. He had the courage to like be himself, which is the thing he keeps on talking about in the documentary. And in yeah. this movie, the denouement is he wears his uniform to the fucking art opening and he accepts a pasta dinner invitation from Mara Weaver. Yeah. Hey. It just feels like that's it's pretty a fundamental. Sushi dinner, but yeah. sushi, sorry. Yes. Right. They're they're gonna try sushi together. They're gonna yeah. it's gonna be a fun new thing for them or whatever. Yeah. I just dislike that the shoe thing is treated as a quirk in this movie. Rather than a sort of multifaceted reckoning with his very complicated sort of sexual identity uh, in real life. And it feels it just feels a little gross to me that it is, is simplified that much. Because I think yeah. that's such a cornerstone of the guy and is the reason that these fucking assholes beat the shit out of him, you know? Yeah. yeah. I, that's yeah. that's just a big sticking point for me. But those that's the end of my fucking two pages of notes. I don't need to read the rest of them. It's much more, it, it's easier for this film to spend time on him navigating relationships with women than the finite details of his, you know, what clothes he does and doesn't want to wear and how he identifies and all of that. Like that's, that's, I don't think that Zemeckis is a filmmaker equipped to deal with that. He's equipped yeah. to deal with, yes. will does, does Leslie Mann like him or not? Like, um, Yeah. Oh, Pleasant. that's the final note I wanted to share. Uh, I'll just read this verbatim. Is proposing with the Purple Heart the most uncomfortable scene in the history of popular cinema? Why is it shot like the chicken scene from Caché? <laughs> it is crazy how far away the camera is. I guess because it's so uncomfortable that yes. it's almost like we just have, we can't be near this. It's too intense to well, even and like just, see. Yeah. They shoot her house cut. like a doll, like one of the doll houses in yeah. this part too. So you're kind of on doll, doll scale with them there. Um, it doesn't right. cut. It lingers for so long past her walking out of frame and him just standing, like kneeling there motionless. And my additional note was it's the opposite of that shot in taxi driver where the camera pans away from him on the phone because it's too embarrassing. Like right. that Scorsese yes, right. is like, this is so emotionally uncomfortable. I don't even want to capture it. And Zemeckis is like, I'm going to force you to watch this for 98 seconds. Hmm. Oh my God. Sounds like it's an interesting and weird movie that's really sort of compelling to watch in its it strangeness. Is. It is. Yeah. I give it a five. It's I, I refuse compelling. to give it a six. Yeah, welcome to I could have right ended now. up like this guy if I did acid a couple more times. That's Man's what I was cradling. thinking too. I was like, oh he, boy, four Man's or five more pig. drops, and I would have been in my backyard of my parents' house in New Jersey. Anyway, burying jeans. Yeah, God, I mean, it was yeah. so close to Can getting you imagine? There. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, just, they're for sale yeah. 2021. <laughs> No, Ben, to mirror what you're saying, I'm so grateful in the year 2020 to not be a guy who's just largely homebred and meticulously rearranging action figures in his domicile. <laughs> just to point out, it is 2021 when this episode comes out. Right, so that's my point. It oh won't my even God. apply it's anymore. Not... Uh, I mean, oh, Emily, shit. it's December. I mean, Congrats. we're close to... Congratulations. Uh, I'll be posting about it. Check out my stuff. I've got hats. I've got shirts. I've got Mary jeans. Can I? Can I? Do you think there's it? any people who listen to this podcast and think it's like Barry jeans, like like they're stained with the juices of berries? 
buried <laughs> genes. I, I like I that. Mean, like yeah. right. you're just giving him oh, another. That's idea. a whole <laughs> different concept, Emily. And that's you're smart. just like yeah, welcome. You beat, you beat the genes with like big bunches of grapes or something, right? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You you crush them with your bare feet, like the, or something the, like yeah. mulberries that really stain. You just smack up branch of mulberries right on them or what about buried genes like a bear attacked them i don't know all right (laughs) we should play the box office game or or what about if you like uh uh sort of like uh uh air spray uh a picture of uh barry from hbo barry on the jeans like i apologize for saying you could do it (laughs) i'm sorry What's, right. what's the word I'm looking for? Not air spray. I know what you're talking about. Stencil. A stencil. Air brush. Air, air brush. Oh, sure. yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking of the Bernie Mac Def Comedy Jam jeans yeah. where he has his own face painted on them. That was the joke I, I was ain't to make. scared of you, I motherfucker. Drank half a bottle of wine during this episode. <laughs> oh out of the bottle, no less. And you're David, still play just the at a box five off. for Marwin. After a half I'm a still, bottle of wine, you're still at a half five. Half a bottle in. I'm still just at a five. This film came out December 21st, 2018. It made uh, just over a black hat. Uh, it topped out at 10 wow. domestic. It, 12 worldwide, am I correct? It only 13 made 13 worldwide. Jeez. 13 worldwide. I wasn't so, looking up this opening weekend, but I, in looking up things around this movie, saw like reporting on the final totals and like analysis of a flop and stuff. And they pointed out that this movie came out the week after our beloved mortal NGs, two big budget universal auteur passion projects back to back that both belly flop. This was the period where people yeah. were like, fuck universal. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mortal engines has already fallen to 13 in its second oh, weekend. It's not even in our top 10. I was hoping no, it, it, it opened at five and fell to 13. On no weekend respect two. for strike. No A respect 77% for strike. drop. Guys, that is extraordinary. Someday. I don't have any time frame for it, but we must do an NG's pod. Oh, Simply we'll we'll must. get to the NG's Emily, one day. we'll do Peter Jackson. We'll do Mortal Engines as a bonus. You're okay. the guest. You I do go. want to point there out. I, I found it in the same <laughs> message board that the same week, the Welcome to Marwin 4K release was canceled. And the Mortal Engines 3K, uh, 3D Blu-ray release were canceled. Those were like the first... Rude. Two so rude. Oh my God. So well, I still have rude. my screener. I actually have a physical copy of, of NGs because I'm not positive that it'll ever be available on streaming. Uh, <laughs> it's probably a well, peacock, so, right? Much <laughs> like the know. characters of Mortal <laughs> Engines, you need to hold on to the relics of the past as we move on to Traction Cities. You need to have that disc and place it next to the statue of a minion. <laughs> um, absolutely. Uh, Thank no, you, Emily. Not Thank you. Peacock. Anyway, all right. Okay, <laughs> number one at the box office is a film we've discussed uh, on this show. We discussed it on this weekend. Um, it's, it was a huge, surprising oh, well, mega hit. I know what it is because I also love this movie very much. <laughs> Great movie. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a comic it's a, book. A, movie. This is really one of my favorite Hollywood oh, Aquaman movie seasons. Yeah, it's a great uh, movie. Aquaman? Yeah, Aquaman. Great Aquaman. movie. It, it is uh, bizarre how big that movie was, considering how weird it was. And I don't say that see, as any sort of I mean, see strike crime, against guys. it. Sea crime. Sea crime. Sea crime. Yep. You gotta, you gotta watch out for those underwater lasers. Aquaman, Nicole Kidman's biggest hit of all time. Number two is I think <laughs> the movie that most people probably would have <laughs> predicted would be number one. It's also Mary Poppins Returns. Week. Yes. Right. A huge underperformer. Yeah, it just felt like that was going to be the big Christmas family movie and that Aquaman was going to be too nerdy and they totally flipped. What a fart that and it, movie was. That, that movie, movie is a, a dry fart. <laughs> yes. Oh. And so people bad. have tried to convince me like, oh, nope. no, it's not so bad. It is so mm-hmm. bad. It's, it's so, so bad. So bad. So yeah. bad. The song. The movie's Rod got Marshall. Like nothing going for it. Just, yeah. oh. The songs are just like. Songs are bad. The There's thing that it has one, going for it is that Emily ben Blunt Wishaw. and Ben Wishaw are professionals yeah. and like They're they, locked in. they do yes. their best. Yes. Yeah. But that's about it. Well, which which one song were you about to say? Me? 
Oh, I thought maybe I was not. a good. Okay. I was a good defend a single song. I was good defend the scene where Ben Wishaw breaks down in the attic. That's the scene <laughs> yeah, where I remember you reported scene. back to me. You were like out of nowhere. <laughs> ben Wishaw is like, I got this. <laughs> oh god but yeah and then like but anytime rob marshall's like i've arranged all these dancers for you they're gonna dance yeah. it's gonna be a big musical number you're like oh all right and he's like yeah, i've decided to cut suck 100 turd. times like yeah. i'm oh. only gonna show yeah. you one fifteenth of this at a time like why it's so it dumb. drives me up <sighs> the wall uh, I feel anyway. like I feel like on Topsy watching that movie. Everything's upside down with all these cuts. I don't know what's yes. number three at the box. Uh, office? Number three at the box office. Another disappointment. A, a a pretty watchable, solid movie considering its background. Hmm. Um, it's sort of a sort of like a side equal in a franchise that's trying to figure itself out. Oh, Bumblebee. Uh, Bumblebee. Yeah, solid movie. That's a pleasant uh, yeah. movie. That's an ultimate, like, gentleman's six and a half to seven. Right. It's just the Iron Giant worse. But you're like, eh, right. it's still, it, right. it's still just, all right. Yeah. Rip off a good movie and get kind of close to it. I'll watch that. And Haley Steinfeld's in it. And she's just yeah, kind of like great. a cut Haley above. Steinfeld right. rules. Yeah. Um, Bumblebee. Yeah. Bumblebee. Uh, well, Emily, you know what? That's okay. But you know, it's it'd got a lot of Smiths your... on the soundtrack, so that's fun. I was gonna say, I think it'd probably be your favorite Transformers movie, Emily. Yeah, possibly by yeah, not that right. that's okay, a big number... honor, but yes. Number four. I like a lot um... of the Transformers movies. All right, <laughs> okay, well, maybe then, you know maybe what? Right. So do we, and we're yeah. all friends here. Yeah. Number four, it's an animated film. It it's it's a it's a big movie that has only, I feel like, grown in influence even in the last couple of years. Moana? No. No. It's grown in influence. It's is it been a out for two weeks. Not not a Disney, but it's it did win Disney. the Academy Award for animated film this year. In 2018, the Academy Award for it is not about animated... a baby who is a boss. <laughs> a baby oh, who is, is boss. I'm I I can't believe I'm not getting this immediately because this is probably a movie I've watched uh, many many times we, at iTunes we, at we, three we, o'clock in the morning. Right? We saw it together. We saw, oh, it's uh, Into the Spider-Verse. That's right. Yes. yes. Oh. I, 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 genuinely a film that feels like... a great like movie. A great, great movie, movie but also a, a kind of organic phenomenon in the likes, uh, the likes of which we rarely see, where I feel like people yes. were kind of cynical about the idea of it. It came out, exceeded expectations, grew, played like a sleeper hit, and I feel like two years later has now been kind of accepted as a classic. Like it only yes. becomes more and more prevalent in conversation, I think, as a reference point, both in terms of what movies can do well and in terms of just as like a cultural meme. It just feels like, oh, that's like clearly just kind of one of the classics. And in terms now. of that's animation, like, like it's yeah. such a, it's so often referenced now. It's like, oh, you can do right. a computer right. animated movie that doesn't have to look like a fucking Pixar movie and like right. And right. Like, it doesn't have to look like shit. Right, it's exactly. like redefined like CGI. <laughs> it redefined mm -hmm. sort of superhero narratives at a time. It can look like Beowulf, like it can just like yeah. look great. Like, <laughs> I hope right. I I, I hope wish there were more Beowulf, Beowulf is in Into there the Spider Verse too. What if Beowulf shows up? He's just like I am Spider Wolf from the That'd Zemeckis universe. <laughs> That'd be great. They should do that. Remember, there's a Zemeckis cube in Ready Player One, another great movie. Uh, New York Film Critics oh, Circle uh, that year. Oh, boy. Um, we were, I remember, and Emily, you probably were there uh, for that, that, was, that voting. Was my I'm pretty one sure. and only voting year. Right. And I remember, like, we had beforehand been like, let's 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 try and get animated feature to Spider Verse. That, I know it's going to be hard. It to felt sell like a radical idea at the time. Right. I remember the two right. of you telling me about like but what this is was our the weird like the competition I mean, was Isle like, of Dogs. Uh, yeah, Isle of that was it. Isle oh. of Dogs, which was ha! you know a literally you know, <laughs> right. Exactly. That was the perception. Was kind of... I remember you saying to me, David, like it's autopilot. They're gonna give it to West just as a career thing as default. And there was also and like Incredibles two that year. You know, like there were uh, there were big you know uh, quote unquote yeah. movies that could have. And we were just like, nah, come on, we're gonna let's. I know people will be resistant to the comic yeah. book thing, and we give it to it. And we were really happy that we did. And then everyone else also gave it, it you know, became, like it totally right. swept. Right. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, God. that's all. Thank God uh, we didn't give it to Isle of Dogs. Sorry. That would have been terrible. Number five yeah, in the movie is a, a great masterpiece about a great man. 
Um, Weird. I mean, Sully didn't come out in 2018. I'm trying to think of what other film (laughs) this could be describing. Uh, It's not The Mule. It is the mule. It what is if there was a mule? <laughs> <laughs> mule. <laughs> oh, God. What a great I mean, one. Thank should, God that was number five and not what's number six, the Grinch. Blech. We should acknowledge the, mule. the the day we're recording this podcast is the day that AT&T announced that all 2021 Warner Brothers releases are going day and date on HBO mm-hmm. Max. And buried in that, I feel like it's not discussed. People are talking about Dune. They're talking about Suicide Squad. They're not talking about the fact that Clint Eastwood's Cry Macho is now going straight to HBO Max. And the idea that I won't get the pleasure of watching Cry Macho, it's six weekend release, a Tuesday 3 p.m. showing that is weirdly 90% full of geriatrics. (laughs) Hell yeah. Is that how you saw The Mule? Do you like my new background, and, Griff? And how I saw Sully. Yeah, it's the Grinch. No, I hate it. <laughs> That's how Why I feel about this this new oh, Warner Brothers. Yeah. yeah. Oh. It's Matthew Morrison. Yeah. Is David the Grinch, is scratching yes. the top of his head like he's oh. thinking hard. You, David, uh, you quote tweeted the news story with just emoji thumbs down, and then someone responded, "I'm dying to hear." Griff Griffin's Lightning's take, thoughts on right. this. As and if I be was like, like, come on! <laughs> Here's my one word response. Guess. Yeah, yeah. get out of here. How do you do think I'm a broken you? person who I Have only like you? going to movie theaters. It is the only activity I enjoy. Yeah. How do you think I feel about this? <sighs> it's bad. Oh. It's really Fucking bad. Whatever. We'll figure it out. Look, we're going to be, I mean, we, we've been talking about it, David. We're going to be like those like fanatical season pass holders who go to every game. And people are like, you go to every fucking Mets game? And you're like, I gotta, gotta be there for my team. And that's how we're going to feel paying some probably like $400 a month AMC diamond pass to be You're able to see be like met theaters. season ticket holders. Yes. The Met. We're going to be like Not the patrons Mets. of the art. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, whatever. Whatever works. They better give you champagne in the lobby, is all I'm saying, if that's what movies become. Oh. I'm now three or like, yeah, through Let me with my buy a toy. Prosecco, something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Griffin chugging <laughs> out of the wine bottle. Chugging out uh, of the wine bottle. Final thoughts. Grave. I like this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. I give it two thumbs up. Ben, Ben. <laughs> I, I have full respect for your respect of this film. I would implore you to watch the documentary. I'm not I saying will. because I think it will make you like this film. Yes. I just think yes. as due diligence to anyone who has not watched the documentary, it is, is a truly a, a great film. I look yeah. forward to it. Uh, I know it's, it's the good. new year, but in case anyone hasn't checked it out, I have a slow Christmas album. It's not too late. It's only been a month. So uh, look that up. And uh, Do you know about this, Emily? He, he promised this in the Polar it. Express episode, yeah. and I think yeah. people assumed it was a bit, and he has played it for us now, and it is frighteningly real. It's and slow. it's not just chopped and screwed. <laughs> it's really, mean, slow. It's it's really, slow. really yeah. slow. It's, it's not slow. just chopped and screwed, but it is chopped and screwed. The That's cops the would pull this thing, thing over and be like, you can't drive this slow. It's not allowed. <laughs> it's too slow. This thing, <laughs> this thing is fucking glacial. You don't, you don't understand how slow this album is. Okay. Oh so it's like, it, it is like uh, an, an, an Inception slow. It's Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. We're four <laughs> levels in. Okay. Yeah. At least. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, this, this is this cool. is limbo. Right. Cool. This, okay. this album is going to function as many kicks to come in the future. Uh, Emily, congratulations on joining the Double Digits Club. Uh, you're wow. the best. Uh, okay. You're the mother Crown. of blankies. I put in the mother. work, and I reap my reward. My reward is yeah. having been on this podcast ten times. So, but uh, also, oh, yeah. I feel Suck I feel it. like I've been getting increasingly <laughs> sappy uh, because of this fucking year when we have our our friends on the show. But like, you're you're such a keystone to this uh, podcast existing oh. in the first place. <laughs> you and, are. And That's undeniably truly, true, and you know it's it. undeniably we, true. We, it's yeah, it's not the, just like a glib title. I mean, it's not just that you like <laughs> named our listenership, but you literally kind of like help define what the show was going to be when we transitioned out of that fucking Star Wars bit. 
<laughs> well, I'm I'm very glad to be here. I'm very glad to 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 have some sort of holiday season pod with you guys and get to hang out into the wee hours talking about movies. It's my favorite so, thing. Uh, I love it. A, a nice I wish we were doing it in away. person. Uh, Damn it. Someday. One of my favorite. Um, for, I mean, it, it is like I, I I was saying this sort of glibly, but truly that 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 season of holiday movies 2018 when this came out, I loved, and part of it was because oh. of 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 my NGs and and, and but going out mm. to with you guys to see it like probably the last week that it was going to be in theaters and so good right. going to the we bar to ahead of time. It was great. It was so fun. Miss you guys. But just every one of those. Like, too, right. Emily. Like, the four of us saw Angie's together. I saw Spider Verse the first time with David, the second time with Ben. I saw yeah. The Mule with ARP. Like, almost every movie in that top <laughs> 10 is a movie I saw. Of course he did. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, right. So it's like almost every movie in that list is someone I saw, is something I saw with like a key blank check figure, yeah. uh, which just it makes me all uh, the more nostalgic for movie going. Um, Emily, Night Call has ended at this point, but people should listen to the back catalog. Yeah, Night Call, the archives live forever. I'm not sure if this will be up or not, but we're, I think we're going to put all of our bonus episodes public. So there might be new to you Night okay. Call out there, which is cool. Nice. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. and that's, that's about um, it for now. And you've gone Hollywood and you're making major moves and there's things you can't talk about, but there are many exciting Emily Yoshida yeah, it's in, yeah. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Twenty twenty one will be have more going on in it than twenty twenty, where I mostly, uh, I don't know, pretended to do my taxes. Um, God, I'm still hey, working. Man, don't talk I, about taxes on this show. Yeah. I already made that yeah. mistake. Eep. I'm pl- yeah. I'm playing that one hard, Emily. Still, that's my main go to. Is like, oh, I wish I. I'm so busy with the taxes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have in so, December. <laughs> so much income to figure out. Oh, oh God. Uh, I yeah. just I can't. The taxes. They're yeah. three pay stubs for two dollars that I haven't reconciled yet. Oh my god. Um no, I'm not in the world folks, of residuals yet, so that'll be a whole They other shoot hell. blood or uh, blue bloods in my neighborhood. Yeah. I, hey baby, look, I'm telling you. The, the two dollar checks never stop coming in on that show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm buying M and M's. I'm buying peanut butter M and M's. I'm buying peanut M and M's. Oh my god! When they reopen the movie theaters, oh, yeah, I'm gonna come it's load over. it. Over. Um, wow. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe. Uh, uh, thank you to. Lee Montgomery for our theme song. Joe Bowen and Pat Rounds for our artwork. Go to blankies.red.com for some real nerdy shit. Go to our Shopify store where the Talk in the Walk 2020 shirts are now available. Should be shipping out along with the pins and the restock of comedy point coins. More merch to come soon. Tune in next week. We're closing it out. We're, we're ending the Book of Bobby. We're talking the witches, a movie I have avoided watching up until this point to make it special. Have you seen it yet, David? Nope. We're getting bewitched by those rascally witches with friend of the show, Richard Lawson. Yay. Yes. Trying desperately Yay. to keep up pace with you, Emily, but I don't think he's hit 10 yet. No, that'll be his ninth. <sighs> oh, my God. Yeah, neck and neck. <laughs> All right, wrap it up. <laughs> That's the end of the show. That's the end of the show. That's the end of the show. And uh, unfortunately, now I have to ask all of you to leave Marwin. <laughs> I won't go. Exile from Marwin. <laughs> You're exile from Marwin. <laughs>